Talmud, Mas Makasu chapter Imishnah how do witnesses become liable to punishment as Zomemim if they say we testify that an and a priest is a son of a woman who had formerly been divorced or a Haliza it is not said in this case that each mentacious witness be himself stigmatized as born of a divorcee or Haliza he only receives 40 lashes if they say we testify that an and is guilty of a charge entailing banishment it is not said in this case that each mentacious witness should himself suffer banishment he only receives 40 lashes Gemara should not the opening words of the mission have been rather how do witnesses not become liable to punishment as Zomemim moreover since we read in a subsequent mission but if the IE counter witnesses said to them how can you testify at all since on that very day you were with us at such and such a place these are condemned as Zomemim does not these imply that those in the foregoing instances are not treated as Zomemim. The Tana had just been dealing with the last mission in the preceding tractate of Sanhedrin to which this mission is but a sequel namely all Zomemim are led forth to meet Italian death save Zomemim in an accusation of adultery against the married daughter of a priest and her paramour who are led forth to meet not the same death as she but another matter of death accordingly in our mission we are provided with other instances of Zomemim where the main law of retaliation is not enforced but a flogging of forty lashes is inflicted instead if they say we testify that an and a priest is a son of a woman who had formerly been divorced or a Haliza it is not said that each mentacious witness be himself stigmatized as born of a divorcee or Haliza he only receives forty lashes what is the sanction for the substitute of penalty said our Joshua believe by our Simeon believe said that it is based on the text and shall you do unto him as he purposed to do that is to say Punish him the culprit and not his innocent offspring but why should not he alone be stigmatized and not his offspring we must needs fulfill as he had purposed to do and in such a case we should have failed to do so Barpeta says that the sanction here for the substitute penalty of a flogging may be obtained by an argument of fortiori what do we find in the case of the desecrator the desecrator himself does not become desecrated by his forbidden association is it not then logical to argue from this that a Zomem who only came to try and desecrate a person but did not in fact desecrate him should not become desecrated himself Robin demurred to this argument saying that if you admit this kind of deduction you nullify in effect the law of retaliation for Zomem Talmud Mas Macus before you might argue what do we find in the case of one who as witness had stoned the person he himself is not stoned is it not then logical to argue from this that one who had only Purpose to stone another by his evidence but did not succeed in stoning him should not be stoned himself hence the derivation as taught from the text in the first instance is the best if they say we testify that NN is guilty of a charge entailing the penalty of banishment what is the sanction for the substitute of penalty said Rush Lakish it is based on the text which reads he shall flee unto one of the cities of refuge which emphatically asserts that he alone shall flee but not the so Memamar Yohanan said that the sanction for the substitute of penalty of a flogging may be obtained by argument of fortiori thus now what do we find in the case of one who had effected his intended act of murder he is not banished is it not then logical to argue from this that Zomemim who had not actually effected their intended act should not be banished but does not this very argument point to a reverse conclusion for is it not logical to argue that he who had effected the intended Act of murder is not to go into banishment so as not to obtain the possibility of atonement, whereas the Zomemim who have not effected their intended act should be allowed to go into banishment so as to obtain the possibility of atonement. Hence, the derivation as from the text given by Rush Lakish is the best. Allah said, Where is there found an allusion in the Torah to the treatment of Zomemim witnesses? Where is there found an allusion in the Torah to Zomemim witnesses? Is it not prescribed then? Shall you do unto him as he had purpose to do unto his brother? What is meant is some allusion in the Torah for inflicting on Zomemim witnesses a flogging in lieu of retaliation. It is written, and they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, and it shall be if the wicked man deserve to be beaten, flogged that the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten forty lashes. Now is it because the judges justify the righteous and condemn the wicked that the wicked man deserve to? Be beaten, but if you refer the text to a case where witnesses had incriminated a righteous man, then came other witnesses who justified the righteous that is indicated as innocence as heretofore and condemned the wicked that is proved the former witnesses wicked men, then you can say that if the wicked man the Zomem deserve to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten. Cannot the sanction for the flogging be derived from the eighth commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. No, it cannot be as that is a prohibition applying to no tangible action, and wherever a prohibition is contravened without involving tangible action, no flogging is inflicted. Our rabbis taught four observations were made in reference to Zomem witnesses. They are not stigmatized as born of a priest and a woman who had been a divorcee or a halyza. do not go into banishment to the cities of refuge. C are not made to pay ransom, and D are not sold as. Slaves in the name of our Akiva, it was stated that they are also not made to pay compensation on their own admission. They are not stigmatized as born of a priest and a divorcee or a Haliza, as we have already explained above. They do not go into banishment to the cities of refuge, as we have already explained above. They are not made to pay ransom because ransom is held to be a form of atonement, and these fellows stand in no need of that who could be the Tana who considers ransom as a form of atonement. Said Arisdad, it is our Ishmael, son of our Yohanan, be Barak, as it has been taught, it is written, and he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is laid upon him, that is compensation for the life of the person injured. Dead, our Ishmael, son of our Yohanan, be Barak, says it is compensation for his own life. The one responsible for the injury is it not right to assume that ultimately they differ in the interpretation of the import of Kofa ransom one master? Considering the ransom merely as pecuniary satisfaction whilst the other master interprets it as a form of expiation of guilt said our papa not necessarily so both may be taken to consider ransom as a form of expiation of guilt only here they differ on this that one master considers the assessment should be based on the value of the injured dead person while the other master considers that it should be based on the value of the person responsible for the injury what is the reason? Underlying the view held by our rabbis they argue that as the same expression for assessment is used in two proximate instances in the same chapter therefore just as in the former instance the assessment is based on the injured dead child the assessment in the second instance is likewise to be based on the dead person injured by the ox and what is our Ishmael's reason he argues that the text states explicitly the compensation to be for the redemption of his life soul and what is? The reply of the rabbis to this interpretation yes indeed the text has it for the redemption of his life soul nevertheless in regard to the amount to be paid assessed according to the value of the injured and they are not sold as slaves our Hamana was inclined to argue that this exemption would be granted only where the innocently accused had the means to pay his threatened fine for inasmuch as he would then not have been sold they the Zomemim should likewise not be sold but where he himself had no means the Zomemim even though they have the means should be sold said Rabbi to him let the Zomemim say to him if you had the means would you have been sold therefore we likewise should not be sold but what our Hamana did propose to argue was that this exemption should be granted only where either he or they have the means but where neither he nor they have means they should be sold said Rabbi to him the divine law prescribes if he has nothing then he shall be sold for his theft which directs that he be sold for theft but not for insidious scheming in the name of our Akiva. It was stated that they do not pay on their own admission. What is our Akiva's reason for this exemption? He considers this compensation as keenness and keenness is not payable on one's own admission. Rabbi commenting on this said you may recognize it as such because you see these schemers have actually done nothing tangible yet they are put to death or made to pay damages. Our Naman commenting said you may recognize it as keenness as the money remains undisturbed in the possession of the owner yet those fellows are made to pay Talmud. Mas Makis how has this money remained undisturbed? Obviously because they had done nothing tangible but that is just what Rabbi said and it should be reported thus and so had also said our Naman said Rabbi Judah Rabbi said that a Zomem witness pays his quota. What is meant by pays his quota if it means that this one pays half and that one half we learn. This already expressly monetary impositions are divided proportionately but the number of lashes is not divided proportionately the stigmatism is applicable where only one of the witnesses was found as Zomem in which case he would be made to pay his half of the fine but does he in such a case pay at all is it not taught no Zomem
have to be paid sooner or later the assessment should be made on the basis of how much one might be willing to offer the woman for her kathuba in the event of her being widowed or divorced or alternatively her husband inheriting her after her death Gamara how is it appraised said Arhist. The appraisement is made on the basis of the husband's claims are Nathan B. Ashai says on the basis of the woman's claims or Papa says on the basis of the woman's claims and strictly on her kathuba mission if they say we testify that NN owes his friend 1000 ZUZ with an undertaking that he will return the same to him 30 days hence while the debtor says 10 years hence the assessment of the fine is made on the basis of how much one might be willing to offer for the difference between holding the sum of 1000 ZUZ to be repaid in 30 days or in 10 years hence Gamara said Rab Judah Samuel said that if one lent his friend a sum of money for 10 years the end of the sabbatical year will cancel that debt Talmud, Mas Macus B even though it might be argued that at the time of its incidence the injunction he shall not exact it of his neighbor is inapplicable it does nevertheless become applicable ultimately Arkahana referred him back to the mission of the assessment is made on the basis of how much one might be willing to give for the difference between holding the sum of 1000 ZUZ to be repaid in 30 days or in 10 years hence now if it were as you say that the sabbatical year cancels the debt and the zomemma ought to be made to pay even the whole capital said rather the mission might be dealing with the case of a loan against the pledge or where the creditor deposited his bills at the court as we learned a loan against the pledge or one where the creditor had delivered the bill thereof to the court is not cancelled by the sabbatical year some report this discussion thus Rab Judah said that Samuel said that if one lends to his friend a sum of money for ten years the sabbatical year does not cancel the debt and even though ultimately it becomes subject to the injunction he shall not exact it of his neighbor yet that injunction is inapplicable at the time of the incidence of the sabbatical year said Arkahana we have learned likewise the assessment is made on the basis of how much one might be willing to give for holding the sum of 1000 ZUZ to be repaid in 30 days or in 10 years hence now if you would say that the Sabbatical year cancels the debt and the zomemum should be made to pay even the whole capital said Rabbi this argument is not conclusive as the mission might deal with the case of a loan against the pledge or where the creditor deposited his bills at the court this also Rabbi Judah said Samuel said that if one says to his friend I lend you this money on condition that the sabbatical year shall not cancel the debt for me the sabbatical year does cancel it is it to say that Samuel considers this a stipulation that is in conflict with what is prescribed in the Torah and the rule is if one makes a stipulation which is in conflict with what is prescribed in the Torah his stipulation is void but has it not been stated if one said to his friend I sell you this thing on condition that you have no plaint of an unfair deal against me Rab says he has a plaint and Samuel says he has no plaint of an unfair deal against him yes but behold on this very point Arain is stated to have said I had it explained to me by Mar Samuel himself that if a person stipulate on condition that you have no plaint of an unfair deal against me he has no plaint but if he stipulate that no plaint of an unfair deal shall obtain in the deal it does obtain exactly the same distinction holds good in regard to the sabbatical year if he stipulate on condition that you do not cancel the debt for me in the sabbatical year the sabbatical year does not cancel it but on condition that the sabbatical year does not cancel it the sabbatical year does cancel it attended taught if a person lends his friend some money without specifying a date for repayment he may not demand it of him for 30 days at least Rabbi Bar had to put forward a reasoned argument before Rab that this restraint could only be intended for a loan against a shader because nobody would take trouble to execute a written instrument for less than 30 days but in the case of a loan parole the restriction did not apply said Rab him no, thus said my beloved uncle it is the same whether one lends against a shader or parole it has likewise been taught if one lends money to his friend without specifying a time for repaying he may not demand repayment for at least 30 days no difference being made whether it be a loan against a shader or parole Samuel once said to our Matina don't squat down before you give me an explanation of the origin of the oft-repeated dictum of our teachers if one lends money to his friend without specification of date he may not demand repayment for 30 days at least no difference being made whether it be parole or against a shader he replied it is written beware that there be not a base thought in thy heart saying the seventh year the year of release is at hand and thy eye be evil against thy poor brother now from the import of the words the seventh year is at hand is it not obvious that it is the same as the year of release what instruction is then a year of Release intended to convey it is to tell you that there is yet another kindred form of release which is it, it is when one lends his friend some money without specifying a date for repayment in which case he may not demand repayment of him for 30 days at least why 30 days because the master has enunciated in other matters that 30 days prior to the incidence of the sabbatical year count as a year Rab Judah also said the following Rab said that if one forcibly enlarges the opening for the neck in a new garment on the sabbath day he is liable in a sin offering our kahana demur to this view asking what is the difference between this process of enlarging the neck and broaching a cask which is admittedly permitted Rab Judah said in reply that there is a rending of integral parts of the woven material in the case of the garment whereas the stopper is not an integral part of the cask but merely inserted Rab Judah also said Rab said that if a quart of wine Fell into three logs of water imparting a wine color and this mixture again fell into a mikwe. The mikwe is not thereby rendered ineffectual. Arkahana demurred to this asking what is the difference between a mixture of wine and water and the dye water about which we learned. Our Jose says that dye water renders the mikwe ineffectual. Said Rabba to him there is a difference as their people call it dye water whereas here they call it diluted wine but yet did not our high teach these spoiled it. Efficacy of the mikwe said Rabba to him there is no difficulty as one rap presents or Yohanan Binuri's view while the other our high presents the view of the rabbis as we learned if a quart of wine fell into three logs of water Talmud, Mosmak is assured of a quart of imparting a wine color and then the whole fell into a deficient mikwe. The mikwe is not thereby rendered ineffectual likewise if a quart of milk fell into three logs of water short of a quart of and then the whole fell into. A deficient mikwe the color remaining that of water the mikwe is not thereby rendered ineffectual our Yohanan Binuri says that it all depends on the color but that is just the point on which our papa sought a solution for our papa asked whether Rab read in the first clause of the mission three logs short of a quart of and if so then a the ten of that first clause presumably holds that a quart of wine which has fallen into full three logs of water would render the mikwe ineffectual and consequently B. our Yohanan Binuri expressed his dissent namely that it all depends on the color rather than on the measure of the liquid in that case Rab as reported above adopted the view of our Yohanan Binuri or alternatively Rab did not read in the first clause of the mission three logs short of a quart of but whole three logs and consequently A. our Yohanan Binuri's dissenting comment referred only to the last milk clause and therefore B. Rab as reported expressed a unanimous view. This was doubtful only to our papa whereas Rabba was certain about it our Joseph remarked though a disciple of Rab Judah I never heard from him that reported topic said Abbe to him you told us about this very thing yourself and this is how you told it to us that Rab did not read in the first clause of the Mishnah short of a court of that our Yohanan descended only from the latter clause and that Rab's statement expresses a unanimous view Rab Judah also said Rab said that if a cask full of water had fallen into the great sea of the Mediterranean and someone immersed himself ritually on that spot his immersion is of no avail to him as we have some misgiving less three logs are left in one spot in this tribute now this applies particularly to the great sea where the water remains stationary which is not the case generally in stream water the same has been also taught if a cask full of wine had fallen into the great sea and someone immersed himself on that spot his immersion is of no avail to him as we have some misgiving less three logs of the wine was left in one spot in this tribute and likewise if a terramalo fell there it is defiled what is the purport of the clause and likewise you might argue that as in the former instance when in doubt you consider the person in status quo i.e. defiled you would do the same in the second instance and consider the terramalo also in status quo as holy the second clause therefore is essential to inform you that the loaf is defiled Mishnah if witnesses declare we testify that NN owes his friend 200 ZUZ and they are found so memem they are flogged and ordered to pay corresponding damages because the title which sanctions the flogging is other than the title that sanctions
The ear is of the same opinion as our Akiba that is that the punishment of Zomemim is likewise one of keenness. Some introduce this Mishnah comment of Ola in connection with them which has been taught and Yeshel let nothing of it remain until the morning and then which remaineth of it until the morning Yeshel burn with fire. Now scripture came and provided here a remedial act to follow a disregarded prohibition. This provision is to convey that no flogging is inflicted for the transgression. These are the words of our Judah. Our Jacob says, No, this interpretation is not relevant as it is rather an instance of a prohibition contravened without action, and any prohibition contravened without action entails no flogging. Now, the general import of the above statement seems to imply that our Judah is of the opinion that a prohibition contravened without action does entail a flogging. Whence does he obtain this principle? Ola submitted that our Judah derived it from the law of the defaming husband. What do we find in the case of the defaming husband? It is a prohibition contravened without action, and yet the offender receives a flogging. No, your conclusion falls short as what do we find in the law of the defaming husband? He is flogged and also pays 100 shekels of silver. But said Reshlakish, our Judah derived it from the case of Zomemim. Now, what do we find in the case of Zomemim? It is a prohibition contravened without action, and yet the offenders are flogged the same. Obtains wherever there is a prohibition contravened without action, but can you argue that from the Zomemim is what do we find in the case of Zomemim? They need not be cautioned, and I say let the case of the defaming husband enforce my argument, and thus the argument turns to and fro the characteristics of one case not being quite those of the other, but they are alike in this that they are cases of a prohibition contravened without action, and in each case the offender is flogged the same. I submit obtains in all cases of a prohibition contravened even without action that the offender is flogged, but yet note what is their common characteristic? They are both cases of keenness. This presents no difficulty as Arjuna does not take the same view as Arakiba, but yet the argument might be carried on. What they both have in common is that they have each some singular trait of severity. Arjuna does not raise this point, but the sages say that they receive only forty lashes and what? Lesson do the rabbis derive from the text thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor they must needs utilize it as a statutory admonition to Zomemim and where does our Meir find that requisite scriptural admonition said our Jeremiah that our Meir found the same in the context and those that remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more such evil in the midst of thee and why do not the rabbis also adopt the same they apply it to another principle Talmud, Mas, Maccus namely that a proclamation and whence does our Meir derive that principle he obtains the principle of proclamation from the phrase in the same passage and those that remain shall hear and fear mission monetary impositions are shared among the offenders but the lashes of a flogging are not shared among the offenders how for instance if they gave evidence against the person that he owed his friend 100 ZUZ and they were found Zomemim they divide the corresponding damages proportionately between them but if they gave evidence against him that he was liable to a flogging of 40 lashes and were found so memem each one receives his 40 lashes gemara each one receives his 40 lashes what is the scriptural warrant for the set of a the term rasha occurs in the text prescribing a flogging and also in the text prescribing the death penalty by order of the court just as the death penalty cannot be effected in half measure so a flogging likewise may not be effected in half measure rabba said we require to fulfill the words and shall you do unto him as he purposed to do unto his brother and this would not be done unless each so witness receives his full due then if that be so why should not the same obtain in regard to monetary imposition money can be unified into one total whereas lashes cannot be so unified mission witnesses are not condemned as so memem until they themselves are directly incriminated how for instance if they had declared we testify that and killed that person and other witnesses said to them how could you testify to that as that murdered person or that alleged murderer was with us on that very day at such and such a place then the witnesses are not there on condemned as so memem but if these other witnesses said how could you testify to that as on that very day you were with us at such and such a distant place then the former are condemned as so memem if other witnesses came and they charged them with perfidy then again others came and they again charged them with perfidy even to a hundred they are all to be executed our Judah says that this is seemingly a conspiracy and the first set alone is to be executed tomorrow what is the scriptural warrant for the set are out of the text says and behold if the witness be a witness of falsehood etc which conveys that he is not a zomem until the lie is given to the body of the evidence in the school of our Ishmael it was taught to testify Against him a wanton perversion Sarah conveys that he is not a Zomem until the body of the evidence is caught. Rovers Rabba stated that if two came and declared that NN had killed that person on the eastward side of the citadel and two others came and said to the former witnesses but were you not then with us at the westward side of the citadel we have to consider if while standing on the westward side of the citadel it is possible to see that indicated spot on the eastward side of it. Citadel they are not condemned as Zomem otherwise they are condemned as Zomem but that is quite obvious no you might say that we should not convict but consider the possibility of the first witnesses having a stronger eyesight therefore Rabba informs us that we do not give such special consideration to Zomem Rabba also stated that if two came and declared that NN had killed so and so early on Sunday morning at Surah and two other witnesses came and said you were with us at sunset. On Sunday evening at Nihardia we have to consider if one can get from Surah to Nihardia between the early morning and sunset the first witnesses are not condemned as Zomemim otherwise they are Zomemim but that is quite obvious no you might say that we should consider the possibility of the flying camel therefore Rabba informs us that we do not give such special consideration to Zomemim Rabba further stated that if two witnesses came and declared that NN had killed so and so on Sunday and two others came and said but were you not with us on Sunday elsewhere it was in fact on Monday that NN killed him or furthermore even if the latter witnesses declared that NN had actually killed the person on the previous Friday the former witnesses are still executed as Zomemim inasmuch as Sunday the time stated in their evidence was disproved and the murderer had then not yet been found guilty and sentenced to the death penalty what new information does he proffer here that the Murderer as well as the perfidious witnesses are ultimately executed we have learned that already consequently if one of these two sets of witnesses has been found Zomemim both the criminal and the Zomemim are executed while the other set is let go yes but one must needs wait to hear the latter part of Rabba's statement in reference to evidence bearing on the time of the verdict namely if two came and declared that NN had been convicted of murder on Sunday and two others then came and said to the first you were with us elsewhere on Sunday but NN was in fact convicted on Friday or furthermore even if the latter said NN was not convicted till Monday the former are not executed as Zomemim because by the time when the first witnesses gave their fictitious evidence the man charged had already been sentenced to death the same principle obtains in cases of keenness fine if two came and said that NN had stolen and killed or sold an animal on Sunday and two others came and said to the first you were with us elsewhere on Sunday but it was in fact on Monday that NN had stolen and killed or sold the animal the first witnesses have to pay the fine nay furthermore even if the second witnesses said that NN had stolen and killed or sold the animal on the previous Friday still the first witnesses have to pay because at the time when they gave their evidence NN had not yet been made liable to pay the fine that these perfidious fellows tried to fix on him. If two came and declared that NN had stolen and killed or sold an animal and been convicted on Sunday and then two others came and said to the witness you were with us elsewhere on Sunday but in fact NN had stolen and killed or sold the animal on Friday when he was convicted nay even if the second witnesses said that NN had actually stolen and killed or sold the animal on Sunday or even on Monday but that he was not convicted and fine till Monday the former witnesses have not to pay the exact lines because at the time when they were giving their perfidious evidence NN had already been made liable to pay the fine by a tribunal Arjuna says that this is seemingly a conspiracy and the first set alone is to be executed Talmud, Mas Macus B if it seems a conspiracy even the first witnesses should not be executed said Arabab the plot was discovered only after execution had already taken place after execution had already taken place then the thing is done. And there is nothing more to be said but said Rabbi here Arjuna means this if there was only one set the witnesses are executed but if there be more than one set they are not executed but does not Arjuna say the first set alone is executed implying that there are more this is rather a difficult point there was a certain woman
Reason of his reservation there is only because people ask in surprise was the whole world standing there with them whereas in this case of the woman obviously those who came last happened to have knowledge of the facts in question and the former had not mission witnesses are not to be put to death as attested Zomemem until after the termination of the trial because the Sadducees contended that Zomemem were put to death only after the accused had actually been executed pursuant to the scriptural text life for life said the Pharisee sages to them but does not the context read then shall you do unto him as he purposed to do unto his brother which clearly implies when his brother is still alive if so what is the purport of life for life you might argue that Zomemem are liable to be put to death from the moment their perfidious evidence had been taken therefore the words life for life are appointed instruction that Zomemem are not to be put to death until after the Termination of the trial Gemara it is taught an eminent disciple put the principle of the mission in this paradoxical form if they have not slain they are slain and if they have slain they are not slain my son said the father or principle is there not an argument a fortiori against your rule our master replied the disciple have you not taught us no penalty is inflicted on the strength of a logical inference for it has been taught and if a man shall take his sister his father's daughter or his mother's daughter it is a shameful thing and they shall be cut off here we have it specified his father's daughter who is not his mother's and his mother's daughter who is not his father's on what scriptural authority is the same penalty extended to one who is both his father's as well as his mother's daughter it is indicated explicitly in the additional instructive words he had uncovered his sister's nakedness he shall bear his iniquity now even without having recourse to this textual addition I could have inferred it since if punishment is decreed in the case of a half sister his father's daughter not his mother's or his mother's daughter not his father's is it not all the more evident in the case of a full sister the daughter of both his father and his mother here therefore you learn the rule no penalty is inflicted on the strength of a logical inference we have established the principle relative to a penalty where do we find it in reference to admonition in the instructive text the nakedness of thy sister the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother thou shalt not uncover here we have specified his father's daughter not his mother's and his mother's daughter not his father's on what scriptural authority is the same prohibition extended to one who is both his father's as well as his mother's daughter it is indicated explicitly in the additional instructive words the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter begotten of thy father she is thy sister now even without this textual addition I could have inferred it since if a man is admonished about his half sister his mother's daughter not his father's and his father's daughter not his mother's is it not all the more applicable to his full sister the daughter of both of his father and mother here therefore we learn the rule and admonition inferred by argument is not warranted and what is the corresponding scriptural reference relating to a retaliatory flogging of so memem it is obtained by the linking of the law of flogging with the law of murder by the term rashi guilty which they both have in common and what is the reference for such as are liable to banishment it is likewise obtained by the linking of the law of banishment with the law of murder by the term rosia murderer which they both have in common it has been taught our judah bitabay said may I never see consolation of Israel if I did not have one so witness done to death too. Disabuse the mind of the Sadducees who used to say that Zomemem found guilty were put to death only after the falsely accused person had actually been executed said Simeon be shaded to him may I never see consolation of Israel if you have not shed innocent blood because the sages declared that witnesses found to be Zomemem are not put to death until both have been proved as such and are not juridically flogged until both have been proved as such forthwith did Judah Bitabe take upon himself a resolve never to deliver a decision save in the presence of Simeon be shaded and all through his remaining days Judah Bitabe used to go and prostrate himself on the grave of that slain witness and his voice would be heard and people thought that it was the voice of the slain man but he would tell them it is my voice you will be convinced when on the morrow of this man's his own death his voice will be heard no more said Araha the son of Rabba to Arashi he might perhaps have Answered the summons of the deceased, or else he might have obtained his forgiveness. Mission IT is prescribed at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses. Shall he that is to die be put to death if the fact is sufficiently established by two witnesses? Wherefore does Holy Writ further specify three? This is only to show their comparative competency that just as three are competent to incriminate two, as Zomemem so are two competent to incriminate three. How do we know that two or three can even incriminate a hundred from the instructive context which has twice witnesses? Our Simeon says that just as two witnesses are not put to death as Zomemem until both have been incriminated, so three are not put to death until all three have been incriminated as Zomemem. How do we know that this also applies even in the case of a hundred from the instructive context which has thrice witnesses? Our Akiva observes that the third witness was superadded here not to make his responsibility the Lighter but to render it as serious for him and make his legal liability equal to that of the others. Now if holy writ thus penalizes is one who consorts with malefactors as one of the malefactors, how much more shall he who consorts with benefactors receive reward as one of the benefactors? Again, as in the case of two witnesses, if one of them was found to be a near kinsman or otherwise disqualified, the whole evidence is rendered void. So is it with three if one of them was found to be a near kinsman or otherwise disqualified, the whole evidence is void. How do we know that this is the case even with a hundred from the instructive context which has thrice witnesses? Talmud, Mos Makis said, Our Jose, these aforementioned limitations apply only to witnesses in capital charges, but in monetary suits the evidence may be established by the rest. Rabbi says it is one and the same rule, be it in monetary suits or capital charges that is provided the disqualified witnesses took part in the Pre-admonition but where they were not of those who gave the pre-admonition to the offenders what could two brothers do that saw someone slaying a person Gemara even two or three can incriminate a hundred said Rabbah and such an incrimination by two against a hundred witnesses could be sustained only where they all had given their evidence in unintermittent utterance Araha of Dipti remarked to Rabbah seeing that unintermittent utterance is generally defined as the brief interval which a disciple would take in uttering the salutation peace upon thee my master and guide the evidence of a hundred witnesses will take a great deal more time than that said Rabbah what is meant is that each one follows the other unintermittently which renders the whole as one undivided group our Akiva observes that the third witness was superadded so it is with three if one of them was found to be a kinsman their evidence is disqualified our Papa observed to have a but then admitting such Extreme pretext against capital punishment. Let the very presence of the murdered man himself at the murder save the delinquent from the death penalty. Said Abe, the penalty can be inflicted in case he was attacked from behind. Let the presence of the victim in the case of sodomy save the delinquent from the death penalty. The penalty can be inflicted where the assault was from behind. And why not let the presence of the criminal in each of these cases be made a pretext for disqualifying the evidence? Abe remained silent when our papa came with these questions before Rabbi the latter replied. The holy writ prescribes at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. The text thus refers only to those who have to establish the matter. Said our Jose, these limitations apply only in capital charges. Rabbi says, be it in monetary suits or capital charges, provided the witnesses disqualified witnesses took part in the pre. Admonition How do we the judges put it to the witnesses said Rabbi we ask them whether they had come as mere onlookers or to give evidence if they say to give evidence and one is found to be a near kinsman or disqualified person the entire evidence is disqualified but if they say they had come as mere onlookers the evidence is allowed to stand what could two brothers do that saw someone slaying a person it is stated Rabbi Judah reported his master Samuel to have said that the Halacha was to follow the view of our Jose while our Naman said that the Halacha was to follow the view of Rabbi Talmud Mos Makis B Mishnah if two persons see the male factor from one window and two other persons see him from another window and one standing midway utters the pre-admonition to him and if some on one side and some on the other side can see one another they constitute together one body of evidence but if they cannot partly see one another there are two bodies of evidence consequently if one of these bodies I has found Zomemem both he and they are put to death while the party that came second is discharged our Jose observes that a male factor is never put to death unless two witnesses had duly pre-admonished him as Holy Writ prescribes at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death another interpretation of the words at the mouth of two witnesses is that the Sanhedrin shall not hear the evidence
Other their testimony cannot be conjoined or proper remark to obey now if in the first instance above where one saw the offense from one window and another from another window simultaneously one having witnessed the whole act and the other having witnessed the whole act you say that such testimony cannot be conjoined is there any occasion at all to give the second instance where two witnesses saw the act albeit from the same window only consecutively and where consequently this one only saw but half the act and the other but half the act obey replied the second might seem unnecessary but for such an instance as incest robber said if they both saw the admonitor or he saw them both they can be conjoined in the testimony as a whole robber further said in reference to the requisite admonition that if it was uttered even by the victim himself or even if it came from some invisible demon it was sufficient our nomin stated that in monetary suits this joint testimony is admissible since holy writ prescribes by the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death it is only in a capital charge that this joint testimony is inadmissible but in monetary suits it is admissible are such demur to this and argued if so why not put this forward as a plea for deliverance in a capital charge why then does the mission state that both either accused and they the zomemim are put to death this is a difficult point our jose observes that a male factor is never put to death unless two witnesses had duly pre-admonished him said our papa to abey is this really our jose's view do we not learn our jose says an about enemy is executed because he is as it were tested and already pre-admonished to this abey replied that the authority of that side admission was our jose be judah as it is taught explicitly elsewhere our jose be judah says a scholar needs no pre-admonition because pre-admonition was introduced only as a means for discriminating between the inadvertent and Deliberate offender another interpretation of the words at the mouth of two witnesses is that the Sanhedrin shall not hear the evidence from the mouth of an interpreter certain foreigners came with a suit before Rabbah and he appointed an interpreter how could he do that do we not learn that the Sanhedrin shall not hear the evidence from the mouth of an interpreter Rabbah understood well enough what they said only he did not know how to reply Talmud, Masmachus, Ale and Tobia were near. Kinsmen to a surety and our papa maintained that their evidence was admissible as they were strangers to the debtor and the creditor but Arhuna the son of our Joshua pointed out to our papa that if the debtor were unavailable would not the creditor come down on the surety mission if one fled after having been convicted at a court and again comes up before the same court the first judgment is not set aside wherever two witnesses stand up and declare we testify that NN was tried and convicted at the court of X and that Y and Z were the witnesses in the case the accused is executed a Sanhedrin has jurisdiction within the land of Palestine and outside it a Sanhedrin that affects an execution once in seven years is branded a destructive tribunal our Eliezer B. Ezra says once in seventy years our Tarfan and our Akiba say were we members of a Sanhedrin no person would ever be put to death thereupon Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel remarked yeah, and they would also multiply shaders of blood in Israel Gemara if one fled and again comes up before the same court this wording implies that the first judgment is not to be set aside in the same court but may be set aside in another court whereas in the next clause we read wherever two witnesses stand up and declare we testify that this man was tried and convicted at the court of X and that Y and Z were the witnesses in the case the accused is executed which conveys a contrary impression said Abbe that presents no difficulty. There are two domains in regard to court decisions one has reference to a Palestinian court the other to an extra Palestinian court as it is taught our Judah B. Dasatai says in the name of our Simeon B. Shada that if a fugitive from Palestine went abroad his sentence is not set aside from abroad to Palestine his sentence is set aside on account of Palestine's prerogative a Sanhedrin has jurisdiction within the land and outside it what scriptural authority is there for this our rabbis taught from the text and these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations in all your dwellings we learn that a Sanhedrin has jurisdiction both in and outside Palestine if that be so what is the import of the limitation in the text judges and officers shall thou make thee in all thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee tribe by tribe it means that in your own gates you set up tribunals in every district as well as in every city whereas outside the land of Palestine you set up tribunals only in every district but not in every city a Sanhedrin that affects an execution once in seven years is branded a destructive tribunal our Eliezer B. Ezra says once in seventy years the question was raised whether the comment of our Eliezer B. Ezra was a censure namely that even one death sentence in seventy years branded the Sanhedrin as a destructive tribunal or a mere observation that it ordinarily happened but once in seventy years it stands undecided our Tarfan and our Akiba say were we members of a Sanhedrin no person would ever be put to death how could they being judges give effect to that policy both our Yohanan and our Eliezer suggested that the witnesses might be plied with intimate questions such as did you take note whether the victim was perchance suffering from some fatal affection or was he perfectly healthy our Ashi enlarging on this said and should the reply be perfectly healthy they might further be Embarrassed by asking, maybe the sword only severed an internal lesion, and what would be asked, say, in a charge of incest, both Abbe and Rabbah suggested asking the witnesses whether they had seen the offenders as intimate as coal flask and probe. Now, with regard to the rabbis, what kind of evidence in such a charge would they deem sufficient to convict according to Samuel's maxim? For Samuel said that being caught in the attitude of the unchanged asked is sufficient evidence. Chapter 2, Mission of the Following go into banishment, he who slays in error, if for instance while he was pushing a roller on the roof, it slipped over, fell down, and killed somebody, or while he was lowering a casket, fell down, and killed somebody, or while coming down a ladder, he fell on somebody and killed him, he goes into banishment. But if while he was pulling up the roller, it fell back on someone, killing him, or while he was raising a bucket, the rope snapped, and the bucket killed somebody, and it's fall Talmud, Moss. Macus B. Or while going up a ladder he fell down and killed somebody he does not go into banishment this is the general principle whenever the death was caused in the course of a downward movement he goes into banishment but if it is caused not in the course of a downward movement he does not go into banishment tomorrow what is the scriptural authority for these distinctions said Samuel it is prescribed or he let it fall upon him so that he died meaning that one has not to go into banishment until something fell in a downward movement our rabbis taught that killeth any person by error precludes anyone that killed with full knowledge who so killeth unawares precludes anyone that killed with intent by error precludes anyone that killed with full knowledge is that not obvious without stressing the text such a one is the son of death said rabbi I would suggest that it is to preclude a case where one pleads that he thought he was permitted to kill that person. Said Abbe to Rabbi, if as you suggest he thought that he had a right to kill, then surely he is a victim of mischance. No replied Rabbi, because I consider anyone pleading that he thought it permissible to kill closely akin to a willful murderer who so killeth unawares precludes anyone that killed with intent is not that obvious. Such a one is the son of death. Said Rabbi, I would suggest that it is to meet such cases as when he intended to kill an animal but killed a man to kill. A heathen but killed an Israelite to kill a premature born but killed a fully developed infant. Our rabbis taught if suddenly precludes from refuge anyone killing through rushing precipitately round the corner without enmity precludes an adversary he thrusts him means with his body or have cast upon him includes an accident resulting from a downward motion as a prerequisite of an upward swing without laying of weight precludes an intended throw in one direction which swerved to another end. If a man lie not in wait precludes anyone who intended to throw an object a distance of two L's but made it go four L's and as a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor provides here a standard for what is the nature of this forest it is a domain affording free access to the injured as well as to the injurer in like manner every place of injury must be a domain of free access to the injured as to the injurer to involve liability for injury are about ask our Yohanan if while a person is going up a ladder or wrong giving way under him comes down and kills somebody how would this be taken was the death to be considered a result of an upward or a downward movement he replied you have indeed laid your finger on an accident resulting from a downward motion as a prerequisite of an upward movement to this are about objected from the mission this is the general principle whenever the death was caused in the course of a downward movement he goes into banishment but if caused not in the course of a downward movement he does not go into banishment now what kind of case would be included in the general terms of the latter principle but if caused not in the course of a downward movement if not an instance of this kind are Yohanan replied following your opinion what instance would you include in the general terms
Killed either in front or behind him by the upward swing he is exempt may we say that this question has already been disputed by Tanaim if while a person is going up a ladder and a rung gave way under him version A has it that he is liable and version B that he is exempt is not the point at issue between them is that one master considers it a downward movement and the other an upward movement not necessarily it may be that all agree in considering it an upward movement and yet it is. Not difficult to explain the discrepancy version A refers to his liability and damages version B to his liability of banishment and if you prefer I might even suggest that both versions refer to banishment and it is not difficult to find an explanation version A refers to a case where the rung was worm eaten while version B to where it was not worm eaten A if you prefer I might even suggest that it was not worm eaten and still it is not difficult to explain version B refers to a case. Where the rung was fixed tightly while version A refers to where it was not fixed tightly mission if the iron slipped from its help and killed somebody rabbi says he does not go into banishment and the sages say he goes into banishment if from a split log rabbi says he goes into banishment and the sages say he does not go into banishment Gemara it is taught rabbi said to the sages does the text read and the iron slip path from its tree would it reads only from the tree moreover the tree occurs twice in the same text and just as in the first instance the reference is to the tree that is being hewn so is the reference in the second instance to the tree that is being hewn our high b ashi observed that rab had said that both sides base their views on a different interpretation of the same text namely and the iron slip path from the tree rabbi maintains that the misara the traditional text unvocalized is determinant in biblical exposition and we may as well read the word as v Nishal and was hurled away and the rabbis on the other hand maintain that micro the text as habitually read is determinant in exposition and here we have a ve nashal and slip but does rabbi actually maintain that the masara is determinant in exposition talmud mas makasa did not our isaac b joseph report our yohanan to have said that rabbi arjuda broez the school of shammai are simian and our akiba all maintain that the micro is determinant in exposition just so but that is why he also enforces his contention with his additional argument moreover our papa observed that if one flung a clot at a palm there by knocking off some palm fruit which in falling killed somebody then we have an instance which will aptly illustrate the controversy between rabbi and the rabbis what is the point of this observation is it not obvious not quite so obvious as you might argue that the falling fruit that killed was according to rabbi but a secondary force Entailing no banishment, therefore our papa's statement makes it clear that it is not so according to rabbi. But what would be a secondary force according to rabbi's interpretation? For instance, if he flung a clot and struck a stem which precipitated a cluster of fruit, and the fruit then dropped and killed somebody, mission if a man threw a stone into the public domain and killed the person, he goes into banishment. Our Eliezer B. Jacob says that if after the stone had left his hand, another person put out his head and caught it, the thrower is exempt from banishment. If a man threw a stone into his own court and killed the person, then if the victim had a right of entry there, the thrower goes into banishment. And if not, he does not go into banishment because it is written as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood. What is the nature of the wood referred to? It is a domain accessible to the victim as to the slayer. Even the same law obtains in every domain which is. Equally accessible to the victim and to the slayer outside this law, as the court of the householder where the victim has no right of entry. Abbas says, What is the nature of this hewing of wood referred to? It is an optional act, even the same obtains in all voluntary acts outside this law, as the father beating his son or the master striking his people or the commissioner of the court administering the Lashkamara a stone into the public domain. He is a deliberate offender, said. Our Samuel B. Isaac, it happened while he was demolishing a defective wall, even then he should be circumspect. He was demolishing it at night, at night too ought he not to be circumspect. He was clearing the debris onto a rubbish heap, onto a rubbish heap. Under what circumstances, if the public pass there often, he is guilty of negligence, and if the public do not pass there often, he is a victim of mischance, said our Papa. No, we must explain the mission by an instance where the debris is thrown on. To a rubbish heap to which people resort for convenience at night time but not during the day yet occasionally someone comes and squats there in such a case the thrower is not guilty of negligence because the place is not resorted to for convenience during daytime nor is he merely a victim of mischance because occasionally someone comes and squats there our Eliezer B. Jacob says that if after the stone had left his hand etc our rabbis taught the text and if he or it found his neighbor he shall flee precludes a case where the victim put himself in the way on this text it was that our Eliezer B. Jacob based his statement if after the stone had left his hand another person put out his head and caught it the thrower is exempt from banishment is that to say that you as a means finding something there already of an issue if so contrast there with that other exposition of the same form of the word in the text it is taught and he found sufficiency to redeem it which excludes other means that were available heretofore that is that he is not allowed to sell a remote property to redeem there with one more proximate or to sell an inferior property to redeem a fair property said Rabbi the expressions must each be taken in its context there the expression and he found sufficiency to redeem it must be taken with its context and his own hand attained and found sufficiency to redeem it now what is the meaning of the phrase and his own hand attained it means what he has attained but now so must its concomitant and found sufficiency be taken in the same sense but now here too the expression must be taken in its proper context and if he or it found must be understood in the same sense as its concomitant the wood what is the case of the wood it was there of initio so must we take and if he or it found to imply that he found his victim who was there of initio and not suddenly coming forward later Abbas all says what is the nature of this hewing of wood Etc. One of the senior scholars said to Rabba what ground is there for Abbasal's assumption that the hewing of wood referred to was essentially an optional task it might as well be a hewing of wood as a religious act for building a sukkah or cutting faggots for the altar and accordingly one might infer that the divine law ordained that the slayer shall nevertheless go into banishment said Rabba to him supposing he found some hewn wood he would not have to hew any and hewing would not then be any part of the prescribed command nor can it for the same reason even in the first instance be taken as part of the prescribed command Rabba thereupon referred him back to the mission outside this law as the father beating his son or the master striking his people or the commissioner of the court administering the last year also he argued where the son or people is already learned it is no longer obligatory on the father or master to teach and strike it should therefore not be considered even in the first instance part of a prescribed command although the son is already taught replied Rabbi it is still obligatory on the father to chasten because it is written correct thy son and he will give the rest yeah he will give delight to thy soul reconsidering it however Rabbi said what I told you was not a correct reply because re-examining the text when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor I say its import is clearly that of an optional act that is if he wishes to go there he goes and if he does not wish he does not go there now therefore if as you suggested the context to you would is to be applicable also to an obligatory act of you and could he sufficiently meet his obligation without going into the forest are at a be then asked of Rabbi does then the conditional particle asher would always imply an optional action if so considering the text but when a man be unclean and shall not purify himself that soul shall be cut off from among Israel Will you likewise explain it as referring only to a case where if he wishes he defiles himself by touching a corpse and if he does not care to defile himself he need not but in the case of an obligatory corpse where the finder could not but defile himself but must needs give it burial would he indeed on entering the temple during defilement be exempt from the penalty that is quite different replied Rabba because there the text distinctly emphasizes Talmud, Mas Makis be he shall be unclean meaning under any circumstances but has not that phrase been claimed for another deduction namely as it is taught he shall be unclean means to include defiled persons who had taken their right of ablution during daytime uncleanness is yet upon him means to include purified persons still short of the atonement right yes replied Rabba but I mean to derive my point by stressing the redundant particle yet some introduce the discussion in connection with the following six days though. Shall work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest in plowing time and in harvest thou shalt rest, says our Akiba. The second part of the text is not needed as a provision against plowing or harvesting in the sabbatical year itself, for that is explicitly dealt with elsewhere. Neither shalt thou sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard, etc. But it is a provision to restrict plowing even in the pre-sabbatical year where its effect extends into the
Commissioner of the court administering the lash now might we not argue similarly that since where the son or pupil is an accomplished scholar it is no longer obligatory on the father or master to punish him it should therefore not be considered even in the first instance as obligatory there he replied even though the son is accomplished it is still a duty because it is written correct thy son and he will give the rest reconsidering it however Rabbah said that first argument I used was not correct because continuing the analogy I argue what is the characteristic of plowing if he found the plot plowed he need not plow again so too is the characteristic of reaping if he found the corn cut he need not cut again but if you assume that the reaping mentioned in the text constitutes an obligatory act then employing the analogy you will conclude that if he found the sheep's cut he need not cut again how can this be maintained is not the bringing as well as the Reaping prescribed mission of the father goes into banishment for the death of his son and the son goes into banishment for that of his father all go into banishment for the death of an Israelite and Israelites go into banishment on their account save for a sojourning stranger and a sojourning stranger goes into banishment for another sojourning stranger Gemara the father goes into banishment for his son did you not say before outside this law yes the father beating his son here it is a case of a son who has already learned enough but did you not also say that even if the son has learned enough the father is still obliged to teach his son he was teaching him only as a carpenter's apprentice even so he was teaching him the means of a livelihood he was already accomplished in another craft and the son goes into banishment for the death of his father the statement was contrasted with that which is taught elsewhere that killeth a person means to exclude from Banishment one that killeth his father or mother said Arkahana it is not difficult to explain the discrepancy the passage cited reflects the view of our Simeon while the mission reflects that of the rabbis according to our Simeon execution by strangulation is a severe penalty than by the sword therefore in the ordinary case of death by error the incurred penalty of execution by the sword has its appropriate form of remission when commuted into banishment whereas in the case of parricide in error the severe penalty by strangulation has not its appropriate form of remission when commuted into banishment on the other hand according to the rabbis execution by the sword is a severe penalty than by strangulation therefore in the case of a parent slayer who committed the deed in error the penalty due is a severe that of the sword and the penalty of the sword has its appropriate form of remission when commuted into banishment Rabbah explained the thus. That killeth a person through error may flee their means to exclude from banishment one that wounded his father or mother in error for you might possibly think that since by deliberately wounding his parent he would incur the death penalty therefore in the case of error he also should go into banishment the deduction however drawn from the text points to exclude one that wounded his father or mother in error all go into banishment for the death of an Israelite and an Israelite goes into banishment on their account all go into banishment what is this all intended to include it is to include slaves or kutians we thus learn here what our rabbis taught in the following a slave or kutian goes into banishment or receives a flogging on account of an Israelite and an Israelite goes into banishment or receives a flogging on account of a kutian or slave now the statement a slave or kutian goes into banishment or receives a flogging on account of an Israelite is Perfectly clear meaning that if he inadvertently kills an Israelite he goes into banishment or that if he utters the divine name in an imprecation against an Israelite he receives a flogging but as regards the second statement and an Israelite goes into banishment or receives a flogging on account of a Kutian or slave while there is a clear case for the Israelite going into banishment namely if he kills a slave or Kutian inadvertently how explained is receiving a flogging you will perhaps explain in case he curse him this cannot be since the text nor curse a ruler of that people limits the offense to a curse uttered against one who acts according to the usages of that people said Arahav Jacob but it might be a case where he the Kutian had given evidence against him the Israelite is liable to a flogging and on being found his own witness is flogged himself and similarly does a slave's liability to a flogging likewise arise where he had given evidence against an Israelite and was then found to be a Zomem witness is a slave legally competent to give such evidence but no said Ara son of Rika the flogging could be explained in a case where an Israelite had struck a wounding blow Talmud, Mosmachis a Talmud, Mosmachis a which is estimated in damages at less than a parata is RMI reporting Ar Yohanan said that if one struck a wounding blow worth in damages less than a parata the assailant receives a flogging and that no analogy between battery and imprecation is admitted save not for a sojourning stranger etc. This implies that the sojourning stranger is treated as a heathen in regard to the law of refuge but then read the latter clause a sojourning stranger goes into banishment for another sojourning stranger in accordance with the law of refuge said Arkahana it is not difficult to explain the seeming discrepancy the last clause provides for a sojourning stranger who had slain inadvertently. Another sojourning stranger whereas the previous clause provides for a sojourning stranger who had slain an Israelite some throw into contrast one scriptural text against another it is written for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them shall these six cities be for refuge and again it is written speak unto the children of Israel and the cities shall be unto you for refuge from the avenger which implies for you exclusively but not for strangers said Arkahana it is not difficult to explain as one text verse 12 provides for a sojourning stranger who killed an Israelite while the other text verse 15 provides for a sojourning stranger who killed another sojourning stranger as against this interpretation some cited in contrast the following therefore stranger and heathen who killed a person are killed in this quotation stranger and heathen are taken together as of the same category that is to say that just as in the case of a heathen killing someone it made no difference whether he killed a person of his own status or not of his own status he was slain so in the case of a stranger it likewise made no difference whether he killed a person of his own status or not of his own status he would be slain said our it is not difficult to explain the seeming discrepancy in the text as one provides for a case where death results from a downward movement whereas the other provides for a case where it results from an upward movement in the case of a downward motion where an Israelite would go into banishment it is enough if the stranger too is allowed to go into banishment whereas in the case of an upward motion where an Israelite is acquitted the sojourning stranger dies for it said Rabba but does not an argument a fortiori demand a contrary conclusion why if in a death by a downward motion where an Israelite would go into banishment it is considered enough for a stranger also to Go into banishment would you in the case of death by an upward motion where an Israelite is acquitted insist on a stranger being killed but said Rabbah the severity is explicable where the stranger thought he had a right to kill said Abay to him if he thought that he had a right to kill he is himself a victim of misadventure answered Rabbah indeed he is for I consider anyone doing wrong thinking that it is permissible as next to a deliberate offender and they both maintain that view. Consistently as both follow their own respective principles as expressed elsewhere for it has been stated supposing one thought it was a beast and it happened to be a human being a heathen and it happened to be a sojourning stranger Rabbah says he is liable and Arhista says he is acquitted Rabbah says he is liable for one who thought he had a right to kill is next to a deliberate offender and Arhista says he is acquitted because one who thought he had a right to kill was himself a victim of a Misadventure thereupon Rabba referred Arhista to the scriptural text Behold thou shalt die because of the woman whom thou hast taken for she is a man's wife what else does it imply but liability to human execution for his error no liability to heaven's displeasure and note carefully the context and I also withheld thee from sinning against me accepting your interpretation how then would you explain this text how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God does it mean only a sin against God and not an offense against man it can only mean that his trial is left to human authority and the same is implied in the former text viz that the trial is left to human authority Abay then referred Rabba to Abai Melikas plea Lord wilt thou slay even a righteous nation but you have there the answer to that plea of innocence now therefore restore the man's wife for he is a prophet Talmud Mosmachus be restore the prophet's wife and were she not a prophet's wife Nietzsche not have been restored but this can only be taken as our Samuel B. Namani had explained it for our Samuel B. Namani citing our Jonathan said that the divine reply was as follows now therefore restore the man's wife in any case and as regards your plea wilt thou slay even a righteous nation said he not himself to me she is my sister and she even she herself said he is my brother Abimelech Melech was told for he Abraham is a prophet and he conjectured from the questions put to him the reply he was to give a stranger coming to a city is generally asked about his food and
These are the words of Arjuna, but Armayur says that these words seeing him not do imply the inclusion of a blind manslayer on what textual ground does Arjuna adopt his interpretation. The wording is when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor, he argues implies anybody, even a blind person, but then comes elsewhere. The qualification seeing him not and thereby reduces the wider application, and Armayur since seeing him not, he argues is a limiting expression, and whoso killeth his neighbor unawares is another. The effect of limitation after limitation logically only amounts to amplification, and Arjuna he takes unawares to exclude intentional injury. Arjuna says an enemy is slain as he is quasi tested, but how they have not duly forewarned him. This mission expresses the opinion of Arjuna Bijuda as it is taught. Arjuna Bijuda says a haver needs no forewarning, as forewarning was only introduced as a means for differentiating between one acting in error or with. Presumption Arsimian says there is an enemy that goes into banishment and an enemy that goes not into banishment. It is taught how illustrate Arsimian's statement that there is an enemy that goes into banishment and an enemy that goes not into banishment in this way if something snapped and a separate object dropped and killed he goes into banishment if it slipped he goes not into banishment but is it not also taught Arsimian says one never goes into banishment until the rammer block had all slipped from his hand which conflicts with the above statements both in regard to something snapping and slipping the seeming conflict in regard to slipping is not difficult to explain as version A deals with a person who was ill disposed towards a dead man while version B deals with one who was well disposed nor is it difficult to explain the seeming conflict in the case of snapping as version A is in accordance with rabbi's view while version B agrees with the view of the rabbis. Mishnah whither are they banished to the three cities situated on the underside of the Jordan and three cities situated in the land of Canaan as ordained ye shall give three cities beyond the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan they shall be cities of refuge not until three cities were selected in the land of Israel did the first three cities beyond the Jordan receive fugitives as ordained and of these cities which ye shall give six cities for refuge shall they be unto you which means that they did not function until all six could simultaneously afford asylum and direct roads were made leading from one to the other as ordained thou shalt prepare the way and divide the borders of thy land into three parts and two ordained scholar disciples were delegated to escort the manslayer in case anyone attempted to slay him on the way and that they might speak to him or Meir says he may even plead his cause himself as it is ordained and this is the word of the slayer are. Jose B. Judah says to begin with the slayer was sent in advance to one of the cities of refuge whether he had slain in error or with intent then the court sent and brought him thence whoever was found guilty of a capital crime the court had executed and whoever was found not guilty of a capital crime they acquitted whoever was found liable to banishment they restored to his place of refuge as it is ordained and the congregation shall restore him to the city of refuge whether he was fled Gemara. Our rabbis taught Moses had set apart three cities on the other side of the Jordan and corresponding to them Joshua set apart others in the land of Canaan and they were made to correspond on opposite sides like a double row of trees in a vineyard Hebron in Judah corresponding to Bezer in the wilderness Shechem in Mount Ephraim corresponding to Ramoth in Gilead Kadesh in Mount Naphtali corresponding to Golan in Bashan and thou shalt divide the border of thy land into three parts means that they shall form triads namely that the distance from the Durham southern boundary to Hebron be similar to that from Hebron to Shechem and that from Hebron to Shechem similar to that from Shechem to Kadesh and that from Shechem to Kadesh similar to that from Kadesh to the north boundary were three cities necessary in Transjordania the same as three cities for the whole land of Israel said Abbe by reason that manslaying was rife in Gilead Talmud, Mos Machis as it is written. Gilead is a city of them that work in equity and is covered with footprints of blood what is meant by covered with footprints Akubah said RLA's or it suggests that they track down victims to slay them why are some further apart at one end and closer together at the other said Abbe because manslaying was equally rife at Shechem as it is written and as troops of robbers wait for a man so doth the company of priests they murder in the way toward Shechem what is meant by the company of Priests said are they formed themselves into gangs to commit murder as when priests go in groups to the barns at the distribution of priestly prime dues but were there no more than six cities of refuge is it not written and to them ye shall add forty and two cities so all the cities shall be forty and eight cities said Abay the main six cities afforded asylum with or without cognizance while the additional cities only afforded asylum knowingly but not without cognizance and was Hebron a city of refuge is it not recorded and they gave Hebron to Caleb as Moses had said said Abay it was the environs he was given as it is written but the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave they to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for his possession and was Kadesh a city of refuge is it not recorded and the fortified cities were Zidimzer Hamath Rocketh and Shinnereth and Kadesh and is it not taught now these cities of refuge are to be made neither into small forts nor Large walled cities but medium sized burrs said are Joseph. There were two places called Kadesh Arashi observed such as Solution to Zephon and the Fort of Solution to turn to the main text. These cities of refuge are to be made neither into small forts nor large walled cities but medium sized burrs. They are to be established only in the vicinity of a water supply and where there is no water at hand it is to be brought thither. They are to be established only in marketing districts. They are to be established only in populous districts and if the population has fallen off others are to be brought into the neighborhood and if the residents of any one place have fallen off others are brought thither. Priests, Levites and Israelites there should be traffic neither in arms nor in trap here there. These are the words of our Nehemiah but the sages permit they however agree that no traps may be set there nor may ropes be left dangling about in the place so that the blood of Enjur may have no occasion to come visiting there are Isaac asked what is the scriptural authority for all these provisions of verse and that fleeing unto one of these cities he might live which means provide him with whatever he needs so that he may live a tanned taught a disciple who goes into banishment is joined in exile by his master in accordance with the text and that fleeing unto one of these cities he might live which means provide him with whatever he needs to live our zeira remarked that this is the basis of the dictum let no one teach mission to a disciple that is unworthy our Yohanan said a master who goes into banishment is joined in exile by his college but that cannot be correct seeing that our Yohanan said whence can it be shown scripturally that the study of the Torah affords asylum from the verse then Moses separated three cities Bezer in the wilderness Ramath and Golan which is followed by in this the law which Moses set before the children of Israel this Discrepancy is not difficult to explain one of his sayings is applicable to the scholar who maintains his learning in practice while the other saying is applicable to him who does not maintain it in practice or if you will I might say that asylum means refuge from the angel of death as told of Arhista who was sitting and rehearsing his studies in the schoolhouse and the angel of death could not approach him as his mouth would not cease rehearsing either upon perched upon a cedar of it. Schoolhouse and as the cedar cracked under him Arhista paused and the angel overpowered him Artentum behind I observed why was Reuben given precedence to be named first in the appointment of the cities of deliverance because it was he who spoke first in delivering Joseph from death as it is said and Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hand and said let us not take his life Arsim gave the following exposition what is the meaning of the text and Moses separated three. Cities beyond the Jordan toward the sun rising it means that the Holy One blessed be he said to Moses make the sun rise for innocent manslayers some say he explained it so the Holy One blessed be he said to Moses approvingly you did make the sun rise for innocent manslayers are some they also gave the following exposition what is the meaning of the verse he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver and who delighteth in multitude not with increase this also is vanity he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver might be applied to our master Moses who while knowing that the three cities beyond the Jordan would not harbor refugees so long as the other three in the land of Canaan had not been selected nevertheless said the charge having come within my reach I shall give partial effect to it now the second part and who delighteth in multitude not with increase means who is fit to teach a multitude he who has all increase of his own this is Similar to the interpretation given by R. Eliezer B. Pedatha, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord, who can show forth all his praise, as who is fit to utter the mighty acts of the Lord, he only who is able to show forth all his praise. But the rabbis, or some say Rabbi Bimari,
What is the meaning of the psalmist's words? Our feet stood within the gates of Jerusalem. It is this what helped us to maintain our firm foothold and wore the gates of Jerusalem, the place where students engaged in the study of Torah. Our Joshua B. Levi said also the following: What is the meaning of the psalmist's words? A song of ascent unto David. I was rejoiced when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord David, addressing himself to the Holy One. Blessed be he, said Lord of the universe. I heard men saying, When will this old man die? And let his son Solomon come and build us the chosen shrine, and we shall go up there as pilgrims. And I rejoiced at that. Said the Holy One. Blessed be he to him. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Better to me one day spent by you in study of Torah than a thousand sacrifices that your son Solomon will someday offer before me on the altar. And direct roads were made leading from one to the other. It is taught our Elizer B. Jacob. Says Talmud, Mos Machis be that the word Miklat Asylum was inscribed at the parting of the way so that the fugitive manslayer might notice and turn in that direction. Said Arkahana, what is the scriptural authority for that thou shalt prepare thee the way, meaning make you preparation for the road? Arhamma Bihanan opened his discourse on the theme with this text, good and upright is the Lord, therefore doth he instruct sinners in the way. Now if he instructs sinners, how much more so the righteous are Simeon Bilakish opened his discourse on this theme with these two texts, and if a man lie not in wait, but God cause it to come to hand, and I will appoint thee a place whither he may flee, and as saith the proverb of the ancients out of the wicked cometh forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be upon thee, of whom does the former text speak of two persons who had slain one in error and another with intent, there being witnesses in neither case the Holy One, blessed be he appoints. Then both to me at the same and he who had slain with intent sits under the stepladder and he who had slain in error comes down the stepladder falls and kills him thus he who had slain with intent is duly slain while he who had slain in error duly goes into banishment Rabbi son of Arhuna reporting Rabbi Huna some say Arhuna reporting our Eliezer said from the Pentateuch the prophets and the Hagiographer it may be shown that one is allowed to follow the road he wishes to pursue from it. Pentateuch as it is written and God said to Balaam thou shalt not go with them and then it is written if the men came to call thee rise up and go with them from the prophets as it is written I am the Lord thy God who teach thee for thy prophet who ledeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go from the Hagiographer as it is written if he is of the scorners he will be allowed to speak scorn and if of the meek he will show forth grace Arhuna said that if a man's layer on his way into Banishment was met and killed by the avenger, he is acquitted because he holds the clause, and he not deserving of death refers to the blood avenger. Thereupon an objection was raised, it is taught the verse, and he not deserving of death is said of the manslayer. You say of the manslayer, maybe it refers to the blood avenger when, however, the text adds also, inasmuch as he hated him not in time past, you have to take it as referring to the manslayer. Arhuna follows another tan as it is taught in the following the clause, and he not deserving of death is said of the blood avenger. You say of the blood avenger, maybe it refers to the manslayer when, however, the text adds, inasmuch as he hated him not in time past, the manslayer is already disposed of. What then can I make of the clause, and he not deserving of death, save that it refers to the blood avenger. Now we learn, and two ordained scholar disciples were delegated to escort the manslayer in case anyone attempted to slay him on the way. That they might speak to him, what did they say to him? Did they not warn the avenger that if he killed the manslayer he would himself be deserving of death? No, not that as it is taught that they might speak unto him appropriate words, they would say, Do not treat him after the manner of shedders of blood. It was but an error that he had a hand in it. Or Meir says he may even himself plead his cause as it is said, and this is the word plea of the slayer. They say to the avenger, much is affected for providence by agents. The master said it was but an error that he had a hand in it. Is that not too obvious a plea? Because if he had committed it willfully, would he be a refugee? Yes, he would be as it is taught. Our Jose B. Judah says that to begin with every slayer, be it an error or with intent, was first sent forward to one of the cities of refuge. The court then sent and had him brought, and whoever was found guilty of a capital crime they had put to death, as it is written, then the elders of his. City shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Whoever was found not guilty of murder, they acquitted as it is said, and the congregation of judges shall deliver the slayer out of the hands of the avenger of blood. Whoever had incurred banishment, they sent him back to his place of refuge as it is said, and the congregation of judges shall restore him to the city of his refuge whither he was fled. Rabbi says they were not sent in. The first instance they went there into banishment of their own accord, thinking that every slayer, whether in error or with intent, was afforded shelter, and they knew not that those cities only afforded shelter to those who had slain in error, but to those who had slain with intent, they afforded no shelter. Our Eliezer said that a city, the majority of whose denizens were quantum slayers, could not by right admit fugitives, because in the ordinance it is said, and he shall declare his words. Cause in the ears of the elders of that city that is declare his cause but not a cause like their own. Our Eliezer also said that a city which has no body of elders could not by right admit fugitives as the elders of that city are required by the ordinance and these were not there. It has been stated the legal status of the city which has no elders was discussed by RMI and RC the one holding it could admit fugitives the other that it could not the one who denied it the right of admitting fugitives argued that the elders of the city were an essential requisite in the ordinance and these were not there. The other who accorded it the right of admitting fugitives argued that it was merely a statement of what was requisite generally the city which has no elders was again discussed by RMI and RC one holding that a person could legally be charged there as a stubborn and rebellious son while the other held he could not be he who denied it the legal capacity of Receiving the charge of a stubborn and rebellious son argued that the elders of his city were an essential requisite in the ordinance and these were not there while the other who accorded it the right of receiving the charge of a stubborn and rebellious son argued that it was merely a statement of what was requisite generally further the city which has no elders was likewise discussed by RMI and RC one holding that it had to bring a murder atoning heifer and the other holding that it had not to bring a murder atoning heifer he who said that it had not to bring the murder atoning heifer argued that the elders of that city were an essential requisite in the ordinance and these were not there while the other who maintained that it had to bring a murder atoning heifer argued that it was merely a statement of what was requisite generally our Hamabihan and remarked why was the section of the law of murder Talmud, Mos Machis introduced by a strong emphatic term is it? Is written and the Lord spake directed unto Joshua saying speak direct unto the children of Israel saying appoint for you cities of refuge whereof I spake to you by the hand of Moses because it was a direction to give effect to what had been ordained in the Torah does it mean to say that the use of the term dabber always denotes strong emphatic utterance yes indeed as it is written explicitly and he Joseph spake hard words to them but is it not taught elsewhere that in the passage then they that feared the Lord spake together one with another means none other than gentle discourse and thus the verse says he shall subdue it for the peoples under us yes but dabber is a form different from it but with consequent different shades of meaning our Judah and our other rabbis differ as to the reason for the introduction of the strong term one thinking it is because Joshua must have somewhat delayed the appointment of those cities of refuge whereas the other thinks it was Simply because of its importance as being an ordinance in the Torah and Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God our Judah and our Nehemiah are divided on the interpretation thereof one taking them as referring to the final eight verses of the Pentateuch while the other takes them to be the section on the cities of refuge now according to the one who holds that they were the final eight verses of the Pentateuch it is quite correct to say and Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God but if they are taken to refer to the section on the cities of refuge how do you explain the wording wrote these words in the book of the law of God we take them in this way and Joshua wrote in his own book these words that are prescribed in the book of the law of God the fitness of a sephir Torah whose parchment skins are sewn together with flax and thread was a point of issue between our Judah and our Meir one declaring that it is fit for public use while the other holds it to be unfit the one who declares it unfit appeals to the verse and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth the whole Torah is set aside by side with Tefillin accordingly we draw an analogy as in the case of Tefillin there is a statute a rule in
that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest and the other since the description high is omitted there in the last quoted passages taken by him as but a secondary reference to one of the aforementioned therefore mothers of high priests were wont to provide food and raiment for them that they might not pray for their son's death the reason given is that the banished might not pray for the high priest's death but what if they should pray thank you he would die surely the saying is as a flitting bird as a flying swallow so the curse that is causeless shall not follow said a venerable old scholar I heard an explanation at one of the sessional lectures of Rabba that the high priests were not without blame as they should have implored divine grace for averting the sorrows of their generation which they failed to do others read in the mission of us that they might pray for their sons that they die not the reason given then is that the banished should pray for the high priest but what if they did not pray for him thank you he would die what should he have done to avert it as they say here in Babylon Toby did the bad jobbing and Zagat got the hard slogging or as they say there in Palestine Shechem got him a wife and Mabgay caught the knife said a venerable old scholar I heard an explanation at one of the sessional lectures of Rabba that the high priests were not without blame as they should have implored Divine grace for averting the sorrows of their generation which they failed to do just as in the case of that poor fellow who was devoured by a lion some three parts from the town where our Joshua be Levi lived when the prophet Elijah would not commune with the rabbi on that account for three days Rab Judah reported Rab to have said that the curse of a sage though uttered without cause takes effect whence is this obtained from the fate of Ahitho fell because when David was digging out the temple's foundations a deep came surging up threatening to flood the world he David asked what is the law about writing the divine name on a shard and throwing it into the deep to make it keep to its own region as no one made reply he said whoever know it on this topic and would not tell may he be suffocated thereupon Ahitho fell reasoned thus in his own mind if in the cause of restoring harmony between husband and wife the Torah said let my name solemnly inscribed in a scroll Rather be blotted out in water may that not the more readily be done for the safety of the whole world yes it is allowed exclaimed Ahitho fell the divine name was thereupon inscribed on a shard and thrown in the deep it subsided and abode in its own region nevertheless it is recorded and when Ahitho fell saw that his counsel was not followed he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house to his city and put his household in order and hanged himself and died Arabab said that the curse of a sage though uttered without cause takes effect whence is this derived from the fate of Eli because Eli said to Samuel God do so to thee and more also if thou hide anything from me of all the things he said to thee now although it is recorded and Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him nevertheless it is recorded and his Samuel's sons walk not in his ways Talmud Mos Machis be Rab Judah reported Rab to have said that a conditional exclusion even if self-imposed Requires formal absolution whence is this derived from the fate of Judah for it is written and Judah said to Israel his father send the lad Benjamin with me if I bring him not unto thee then let me bear the blame forever and on this theme our Samuel be not he repeated how his master our Jonathan said what are the illusions in the text let Reuben live and not die and let not his men be few and this is unto Judah and he Moses said Lord hear the voice of Judah and bring him unto his people let his hands be sufficient for him and be thou in help to him from his enemies all through the forty years that Israel remained in the wilderness Judah's bones were jolted about in their coffin until in the end Moses stood up and supplicated for mercy on his behalf Lord of the universe said he who influenced Reuben to make free confession of his guilt was it not Judah and this was due to Judah and he Moses said Lord hear the voice appeal of Judah thereupon joint slipped into socket Judah not having yet been ushered into the celestial college Moses again prayed and bring him unto his people Judah being unable to parry and debate through prolonged absence Moses prayed let his hands capacity be sufficient for him being unable to disentangle analyze or explain intricate points raised in discussion Moses prayed and be thou in help unto him from his adversaries all permit of the return of the manslayer the question was raised does the text mean that a manslayer returns home at the death of all the contemporary high priests or at the death of any one of them come and here if his trial was concluded while there was no high priest in office the manslayer can never come home and now if it were as you suggest alternatively he would get home at the death of any one of the high priests know the next mission means when there is none in office at the time mission if the high priest died at the conclusion of the trial the slayer goes not into banishment if he died before the trial was concluded and another high priest was appointed in his stead and the trial was then concluded the slayer returns home after the latter's death if the trial was concluded when there was no high priest in office or where the high priest was the victim or where the high priest was the manslayer the slayer can never come away from that place of refuge he the slayer may not go out thence to bear witness in respect of some religious observance nor as witness in a monetary suit nor as witness in a capital charge nor even should all Israel have need of him not even if he be captain of the host like Joab Bezeruah he may never go out thence as it is said he fled there to indicate that there must be his abode there his death there his burial just as the city affords asylum so does its boundary afford asylum if a slayer went beyond the bounds and the blood avenger fell in with him our Jose the Galilean says that for the Avenger it is a matter of obligation to strike for everyone else a matter of option our Akiva says that for the avenger it is a matter of option and anyone else I is not responsible for him Gamar if the high priest died at the conclusion of the trial the slayer goes not into banishment what is the reason for this remission said Abay we infer it a force for what happens to a slayer who had already gone into banishment he comes out free now on the death of the high priest is it not a logical argument to say that he who had not gone into banishment should not have to go at all on the intervention of the death of the high priest but perhaps there is this to be said that while he who had gone into banishment had suffered for his atonement this one who has not yet gone into banishment has not yet been granted it no do you think it is banishment that procures atonement remission of exile it is the death of the high priest that procures the atonement if he Died before the trial was concluded, the slayer returns home after the latter's death. Whence is this derived? Arkahana said, The text says, And he shall abide in it the city of refuge unto the death of the high priest whom he had anointed with the holy oil. Was it he the slayer that anointed the high priest? But the implication is that the high priest who was anointed in his the slayer's days, what should the high priest the latter have done to avert the unhappy event? He should have implored divine mercy for the slayer's acquittal, which he seemingly failed to do. Abay observed, We have it on good authority that if the slayer died on the conclusion of the trial, his bones body would be conveyed thither, as it is written that he should come back to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. Now, what dwelling is it that is in the land in the soil you are bound to say the burial place? A tanit taught if the slayer died in banishment before the high priest. Day. Convey on the death of the latter the bones body of the slayer to the sepulcher of his forebears as it is written and after the death of the high priest the slayer shall return to the land of his possession now what return is it that is to the land of his possession you are bound to say it is burial in the ancestral soil exile could not depend on the amount of suffering involved in exile as one may have to spend a day and another whole lifetime in exile cf also tosaf svhsh and where the trial had been concluded and the high priest was then found to be the son of a divorcee or halyas of this case was discussed by rmi and r isaac napaha one said that in effect the priestly office dies and the other said that the priestly office has become void could it be suggested that they were differing on the same point as that on which our Eliezer and our joshua differed for we learned if while engaged in offering on the altar a priest is discovered to be the son of a divorcee or Halyaz our Eliezer says that all offerings hitherto laid by him on the altar are become vitiated. Our Joshua declares them appropriate accordingly. He who in the former instance held that the discovery meant in effect the death of the priestly office takes the view of our Joshua and the other who said that it has become void takes the view of our Eliezer Talmud. Mos Machis a no accepting our Eliezer's point of view there can be no divergence whereas from our Joshua's point of view it may be argued that he who says that the priestly office died follows our Joshua's view and the other who says that the priestly office has become void might explain that our Joshua considered all the past offerings as appropriate for some special reason because it is written bless Lord hello his substance and accept the work of his hands which if read as hello means to include the work of even the profane vulgarized in his midst whereas here in regard to the liberation of refugees even are Joshua might admit that the priestly office is rendered void if his trial was concluded he may not go out thence not even if he be captain of the host
There is death, there is burial. The case of the slayer is different because the divine law has distinctly indicated his special treatment just as the city affords asylum, so does its boundary afford asylum against the some cited the following it is written and he shall abide in it that means in the city of refuge but not in its outer bounds said Abay this is no difficulty here in our mission the point under consideration is its domain as an asylum whereas there in the cited passage it is its limitation as a domicile but is not that last point to be derived from the fact that a field is not turned into suburb nor suburb into field nor suburb into city nor city into suburb said our she's hate yes but we still need that other statement if only to debar subterranean retreats if a slayer went beyond the bounds and the blood avenger fell in with him etc our rabbis taught and the avenger of blood shall slay the man slayer there shall be no blood guiltiness for him this means that it is an obligation for the blood avenger to slay the vagrant murderer. If there be no blood avenger, it is permissible for anyone to do so. These are the words of our Jose the Galilean. Our Akiva says it means that it is permissible for the blood avenger, and everyone else is not responsible for him. What is the reason for the view of our Jose the Galilean? Is it written if he shall slay him? And what is our Akiva's reason? Does it say he shall slay him? Here's a Marzitra Bitobia. Citing Rab said if a slayer who had gone beyond the bounds of the city of refuge was met and slain by the avenger of the blood, the latter is slain on that account whose view does Rab follow. It is in accord with neither our Jose the Galilean nor with our Akiva. It is in accord with the view of the following ten, as is taught. Our Eliezer says that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation of judges for judgment. What does this teach? Since it is said, and the avenger of blood. Shall slay the manslayer one might presume that he the avenger may do so forthwith therefore does the earlier text provide that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation of judges for judgment and what deductions do our Jose and our Akiba obtain from until he stand before the congregation they require the text for another ruling as it is taught our Akiba says whence may it be shown that if a Sanhedrin had been eyewitnesses to an act of murder they cannot themselves have him put to death until he stand for trial before another tribunal from the instructive text the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation of judges for judgment which means not until he stood for trial before another tribunal our rabbis taught but if the slayer do verily come out beyond the border of the city of refuge there shall be no blood guiltiness from this I learn only a case of deliberate egress whence do I derive that the same law applies for an unintentional Strayer from the instructive double verb which implies a coming out anyway but then is it not taught elsewhere if the slayer comes out beyond the bounds deliberately he is slain if in error he goes into banishment this is no difficulty one beretha is in accordance with the view that the Torah uses occasionally popular idiom while the other beretha follows the view that the Torah does not use popular idiom have a remarked it seems logical to take the view that the Torah does occasionally use popular idiom as you could not treat his later act of accidental straying more severely than his first act of accidental killing arguing what is the law in his first act if the killing was deliberate he is slain if in error accidental he goes into banishment similarly in his later act of vagrancy if the vagrancy was deliberate he is slain by the avenger with impunity if in error accidentally a slayer goes into banishment it is taught in one beretha eve. Father killed a son, his other son becomes the avenger of blood again. It is taught in another bury the one's own son cannot become the avenger of blood. Now could it be suggested that the first reflects the view of our Jose the Galilean, while the second reflects that of our Akiba? Can this be maintained for whichever view you take of the avenger's role, whether that of the one who regards it as obligatory or of him who says it is optional? Is it admissible? Did not rabbi son of our Hunase and the same is taught by one of the school of our Ishmael never is a son to be commissioned by the court to punish his father, whether it be to inflict a flogging or pronounce a formal execration on him, save only in the case of one who entices another to idol worship, because there the Torah says, Neither shall thine I pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him, thine hand shall be first upon him, but the seeming incongruity is not. Difficult to explain one bury the treats of a son against the father, the other of a grandson against his grandfather. Mishnah, if a tree standing within the boundary has its boughs extending beyond the boundary, or standing without the boundary has its boughs extending within it, wholly follows the position of the boughs. Gemara, a point of difficulty was raised from the following if a tree standing within the wall of Jerusalem overhangs outside, or standing without overhangs inside the part which bends over the wall from the wall inwards is considered as within the wall, and that part which bends over the wall from the wall outwards is considered as without the wall. You cannot raise a point from the law of second tides as against the law of the cities of refuge. There is no comparison. Tides are associated by the divine law with the wall of the holy city, whereas the cities of refuge are governed in the divine law by the principle of domicile. Now it is the Bows that afford shelter of domicile, not the root of a tree, then the same point might be raised from another barrier regarding the law of tides, where it is taught in regard to Jerusalem. Follow the bow in regard to the cities of refuge. Follow the bow said Arkahana. There is no difficulty when this latter citation presents the view of Arjuda, while the other, the former, adopts the view of the rabbis as is taught Talmud. Mosmachus B. Arjuda says, In the case of a cavern, follow its opening. In the case of a tree, follow the bow. Let us grant that we may legitimately suppose Arjuda to apply this principle to the second tides, where it would lead to a more strict observance. Thus, if the root is outside the wall and the bow overhangs inward, he maintains that just as the owner may not redeem the fruits of the second tide under the bow, so he may not redeem those at the root. And again, if the root is inside the wall and the bow overhangs outside, he maintains. That just as he may not eat the fruits of the second tithe under the bow without first redeeming them, so he may not eat even those at the root without first redeeming them. But take now the case of a city of refuge. The application of the same principle goes perfectly well where the root lies beyond the boundary and the bow overhangs inside. Just as the avenger may not slay the manslayer at the bow, so he may not slay him at the root, but where the root is within and the bow extends. Beyond are we to say that just as the avenger may slay him at the bow, he may also slay him at the root. Surely he the manslayer stands within said Rabba. It might be nobody would dispute where he the manslayer stands at the root within the boundary that the avenger dare not slay him, nor would anybody dispute where he stands at the bow outside, and the avenger can attack him by means of arrows or stones that he may kill him, but difference of opinion may arise as to whether the root may be regarded as some sort of ladder for getting onto the bow in this case one master considers that part of the root as a mere ladder for the bow while the other master holds that the root cannot be considered a ladder for the bow or as she says what is the meaning of the expression it entirely follows the bow it means follow also the bow mission if while a refugee he slew someone in that city of refuge he is banished from one quarter thereof to another and a levite is banished from one city to another Gemara our rabbis taught it is written then i will appoint unto thee a place whether he may flee the words then i will appoint unto thee implied during thy lifetime unto thee a place means in your place whether he shall flee indicates that the israelites sent slayers into banishment while yet in the wilderness whether did they send them into banishment to the levitical camp from this text they ruled that if a levite slew someone he was banished from one province to another, and that if he went into banishment to his own native province, it does afford him asylum. Said Araha, the son of Araka, what is the scriptural warrant for this rule? Because he shall abide in the city of his refuge, which implies the city which has already afforded him shelter before Mishnah. Similarly, a manslayer, if on his arrival at the city of his refuge, the men of that city wish to do him honor, should say to them, I am a manslayer, and if they say to him, Nevertheless, we wish that he should accept from them the proffered honor, as it is said, and this is the word of the manslayer Talmud. Mosmachus, they used to pay rent to the Levites. These are the words of Arjuda. Our Meir says that they did not pay them any rent, and on his return home, he returns to the office he formerly held. These are the words of our Meir. Arjuda says that he does not return to the office he formerly held. Gemara said Arkahana, the difference of opinion on the question of Rent is only in regard to the main six cities of refuge as one master takes the words and the cities shall be unto you for refuge to mean for the purpose of refuge and no more while the other master takes unto you to mean yours for all your needs but as regards the other 42 additional cities they are agreed that they did pay the rent said Rabba to him the expression unto you certainly implies here for all your requirements but said
of Arjuna but Armayur says that he returns also to the station occupied by his fathers and he derives this interpretation from the use of the same expression Yashab he shall return both here and there C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I mission and these encourage judicial flogging one who came Karnala to his sister to his father's sister to his mother's sister to his wife's sister to his brother's wife to his father's brother's wife or to an Adaha priest on taking to wife a widow or an Ordinary priest on taking a divorce or halyza any Israelite on taking to wife a mamzareth or Nathanite woman or any Israeli test becoming the wife of a mamzer or Nathanite in the case of a divorce widow a high priest is liable on two counts but an ordinary priest in the case of a divorce halyza is liable only on one count one who while unclean ate holy meat or entered the sanctuary one who ate hell of blood or leavings of sacrificial meats or pickle or an offering that has become unclean one who slaughters or offers up a sacrifice out of precincts one who ate leavened bread during the Passover one who partakes of food or drink or does work on the day of atonement one who compounds ingredients as for the anointing oil or the ingredients as for the incense or anoints with the holy oil for anointing one who eats of nibble or trefa or any of the creatures deemed abominable and teeming who eats of tebal or first tithe still comprising its prime due or second. Tithe unredeemed or of sanctuary gifts unredeemed how much of people is one to eat to become liable our Simeon says the merest morsel the sages say in olive size said our Simeon do you not admit that if one ate the minute test and he would be liable said they to him only because it is a separate creature said he to them even so a grain of wheat is a separate entity Gemara and these incur a flogging etc this mission it should be noted mentions instances of a flogging for such as incurred the penalty of Karath but not any of such as have incurred the penalty of death by sentence of the court whose is of you presented in this mission it is our activist as may be gathered from what is taught in the following both offenders who are liable to Karath and offenders who are liable to death by sentence of the court Talmud Mos Makis B are alike subject to the sanction of forty lashes these are the words of our Ishmael our activist says that only those who are liable to Karath are subject to the sanction of forty lashes because if the offenders should betake themselves to repentance before God the heavenly tribunal would grant them remission whereas those who have become liable to death by sentence of the human court are not subject to the punishment of forty lashes because even if they should do penance the earthly tribunal would not grant them remission our Isaac says seeing that Holy Writ had already comprehensively declared all the offenders in unlawful relations to be liable to Gareth what object was there in reiterating that penalty solely in the case of the brother with his sister to show that Gareth is their penalty not a flogging what is our Ishmael's reason it is written if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law and it is further written then the Lord will make thy strokes pronounced I should not have known what is really meant by this pronouncement but when it states elsewhere if the wicked man deserve to be beaten it Judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to the measure of his misdeed by number forty stripes. Then I say that the expression this pronouncement has some bearing on the judicial flogging and that passage is introduced by if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law, but if so, why not impose a judicial flogging also for the neglect of the positive precept? It says if thou wilt not observe to do, and this is the sense given by our as reporting our for our Aben reported our to have said that wherever the expression observe lest or do not occur in holy writ it is an indication of a prohibited action, then why not give a flogging for the contravention of a prohibition attended by no action? It is written if thou wilt not observe to do that again, why not give a flogging also for offending against the prohibition which can be remedied by a subsequent action and act entailing a flogging must conform with it. Prohibition of Muslim and what is our Akiba's reason it says according to the measure of his misdeed which means that you make him liable to punishment for one misdeed but you cannot hold him liable in two ways as for two misdeeds and our Ishmael this objection applies only to such diverse punishments as a death sentence and pecuniary compensation or a flogging and pecuniary compensation but death and a flogging are cognate as flogging is but a protracted death but why should not our Akiba if he so interprets the wording exclude from a flogging also even those liable in Karath and if you are you suppose the offenders should betake themselves to repentance before God then I retort now after all they have not yet done so said our Abba the Torah distinctly includes those who have incurred Karath among those who may receive a flogging for we derive before the eyes from before thine eyes to this our Abba be metal the strongly if so why not include as well those liable to death by sentence of the court among those who may receive a flogging by deriving from the eyes from before thine eyes it is admissible to interpret before the eyes in the light of before thine eyes but hardly to interpret from the eyes in the light of before thine eyes but what matters such a slight variation in form was it not taught in the school of our Ishmael that the variant expressions and the priest shall come again and, and he shall go in and see have the same import therefore the purpose of deduction nay furthermore one ought to be able to interpret from the eyes of in the light of before the eyes of their people after having already been allowed to interpret before the eyes in the light of before thine eyes the explanation that our Samuel son of our Isaac later personally received from him on the difficulty arising from our Akiva's interpretation of the text according to the measure of his misdeed as meaning that you make him liable to punishment for one misdeed but you cannot hold him liable in two ways as for two misdeeds was that the verse refers only to penalties that are entrusted to Beth Din Rabbah said where the forewarning to the would-be offender was in respect of a death penalty opinion would be unanimous that the offender should not be both flogged and put to death the difference however arises where the forewarning was only in respect of a flogging in that case our Ishmael holds that a prohibition which has been stated to serve as a forewarning to a capital sentence is sufficient warrant for the infliction of a flogging while our Akiva holds that a prohibition which has been stated to serve as a forewarning to a capital sentence is no warrant for a flogging but if so then even those liable to Gareth should also be excluded by him from the liability to flogging since the prohibition in regard to such transgressions has in each case been stated to serve as a forewarning to Gareth said our Mordecai to our Ashi thus said Abimi of Agronia in the name of Rabba that would be offenders in a case of Karath do not require forewarning the proof is that Karath is imposed for neglecting the right of the Paschal Lamb and the right of circumcision although there is no other warning in Holy Writ maybe the forewarning is inscribed in the Torah in case of Karath for the purpose of a sacrifice as might be proved from the fact that the neglect of the Paschal Lamb or circumcision for which no forewarning is inscribed in the Torah does not entail an atoning sacrifice no this is not a correct reason for the absence of sacrificial atonement in those two instances but there is another reason altogether it is because we find the sin of idolatry set in the balance against the entire body of commandments in the Torah and from this we are you just as the precept relating to idolatry is of the type sit still and don't do it so any precept which is of the type sit still and don't do it entails a sin offering for its unintentional transgression and we exclude these which are of the type get up and do it Rabbanah said after all the various explanations offered we must come back Talmud, Mos Makis to the original statement of our Akiva namely that if those liable to Karath should resort to repentance the heavenly tribunal would grant them remission and in regard to the objection now after all they have not yet done so I you repented I retort the penalty of Karath is not yet decided either. Our Isaac says seeing that Holy Writ had already comprehensively declared all the offenders in unlawful relations to be liable to Karath what object was there in reiterating that penalty in the instance of the brother with his sister to show that Karath is their penalty not a flogging and the rabbis how do they explain the reiteration of the penalty of Karath in the case of the brother with his sister it is to indicate the principle of distributive incidents as instanced in Aryohan hands. Statement for our Yohanan said the Mishnah means to teach us that should one happen to commit all these offenses in one spell of unawareness he would on discovering his error become liable to a sin offering on each act separately and our Isaac once does he obtain that distributive principle he derives it from the text and thou shalt not approach unto a woman one being in the separation of her uncleanness which he takes to indicate liability for any and every woman approached while being in that state and why do not the rabbis derive the principle from this text they do indeed so but if so what would be the purpose of the reiteration of Karath in the instance of the brother with his sister to indicate separate liability for the several offenses with his sister his father's sister and his mother's sister but is not that obvious are they not diverse persons and of different denominations
be solved by an argument of fortiori thus what say we in the problem of the that although each error is a sin of the same denomination he is nevertheless liable a sin offering on each act severally should he not all the more be held liable on each count where the sinful act falls under three different denominations and the rabbis what say that the argument of fortiori is not sound for how can you argue from the where several distinct persons are involved to this where there is only one person and the other are Isaac likewise accepts the refutation of that of fortiori but he derives the principle of distributive incidents from the redundant expression of his sister in the latter part of the same verse and the other rabbis what say that is the purport of repeating the expression his sister in the latter part of that verse they say it lays down specifically the penalty of a brother with any sister his sister who is both his fathers and mothers Daughter to indicate the legal principle that penalties inferred by argument are not sanctioned and the other are Isaac whence does he derive this legal principle if I may I would say that he derives the penalty from the prohibition or if I may I should say that he derives a Talmud, Mas Macus be from the redundant expression of his sister in the former part of the text and the other rabbis they require it to teach the principle of distributive incidents in the case of one who both compounds the prescribed ingredients for the holy anointing oil and anoints therewith and the other are Isaac he shares the view of our Eliezer quoting our Hashai for our Eliezer in the name of our Hashai said that wherever you find two prohibitions with the sanction of Kareth mentioned only once each lapse occasions a sin offering on its own account or if you wish I should say that our Isaac does not adopt the view of our Eliezer as citing our Hashai but he derives the principle of distributive Incidents from the following text and if a man shall lie with a woman one having her sickness and the other rabbis the text is required for another point as reported by our Yohanan for our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biohe how can it be shown that a woman is not ritually unclean as parturient until the flux emerges through the normal passage from the wording of the text and if a man uncovered the fountain of her flux which teaches that a woman is not unclean as parturient until it emerges through its normal passage one who while unclean ate holy meat or entered the sanctuary incurs correct and consequently a flogging this is quite in order where one while ritually unclean entered the sanctuary because both the penalty and the requisite forewarning are written explicitly the penalty as it is written he hath defiled the tabernacle of the Lord that soul shall be cut off from Israel the forewarning as it is written that they the unclean defile not there Holy part of the camp, but as regards the unclean who ate holy meat, the penalty I grant is written, but the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord having his uncleanness on him, that soul shall be cut off from his people. But where is found the requisite forewarning for this wretch later said that it is found in the text, she shall touch no hallowed thing, or you had and said that Bardella taught it as derived from the recurring expression of his uncleanness in two relevant passages. Here it is written, having his uncleanness on him shall be cut off, and in the other context it is written, he shall be unclean, his uncleanness is yet upon him, just as in this latter passage there is given the warning and the penalty. If he does so in the former passage, we associate with it a warning and penalty. Now we understand why Reshlakes does not give the same explanation as our Yohanan, namely that he had not received it on tradition from his Master, but why should Aryohan not accept the explanation of Reshlakish? He will tell you that the text she shall touch no hallowed thing serves as admonition in respect of Teramah, and whence does Reshlakish derive the requisite admonition in regard to Teramah? He derives it from the wording what man person soever of the seed of Aaron is a leper or hath an issue, he shall not eat of the holy things until he be clean. Now, what holy things are permitted as food to the seed of Aaron? Alike you are bound to say Teramah, and the other Aryohan, and that passage refers to eating of Teramah in uncleanness, while this text forbids touching Teramah. But how can Reshlakish take the text she shall touch no hallowed thing for that stated purpose? Does he not require it to serve as forewarning against the unclean person touching holy things as was stated? If a ritually unclean person touches hallowed meat, Reshlakish says he incurs a flogging, whereas Aryohan says he does not. Incur a flogging Reshlakish says he incurs a flogging as it is written she shall touch no hallowed thing or Yohanan says he incurs no flogging as the text is a forewarning against Terah Reshlakish can answer that the unclean who touches hallowed meat is liable to a flogging because the Almerciful has expressed the prohibition of eating hallowed meat in terms of touching while the warning against the eating thereof is deduced from the fact that hallowed thing and the sanctuary are placed in juxtaposition but yet again I asked did Reshlakish base that view on this text does he not require it in reference to the question of one who eats holy flesh prior to the sprinkling of the blood of the sacrifice on the altar for it has been stated if an unclean person ate holy flesh prior to the sprinkling of the blood on the altar Reshlakish says he incurs a flogging or Yohanan says he incurs not a flogging Reshlakish says he incurs a flogging because of the warning she shall Touch no holy thing it being immaterial whether he ate of it before the sprinkling or after the sprinkling or Yohanan says he incurs no flogging here Yohanan adheres to his own line of interpretation after Bardella namely linking as analogous the two passages having the expression of his uncleanness in common and argues or Yohanan the expression uncleanness is written in respect of the passage sacrificial flesh after the sprinkling that Reshlakish derives from the comprehensive negative she shall touch no hallowed thing it is taught in accordance with the view of Reshlakish she shall touch no hallowed thing is the admonition to one while ritually unclean not to eat of hallowed flesh you say it is an admonition against eating or may it perhaps but be an admonition against touching only the text reads she shall touch no hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary thus equating by juxtaposition hallowed thing with entering the sanctuary now that which is Incurred by entering the sanctuary while unclean, namely the loss of a soul, Kareth. So likewise, all the prohibitions in regard to hallowed things involve as penalty the loss of a soul. But if you take it literally as an admonition against touching, is there any instance where mere touching holy meat entails the loss of a soul? It cannot therefore mean but contact by eating or while unclean entered the sanctuary. Rabbi Barhana reporting our Yohanan said the contravention of any negative command which is preceded by a positive command entails a flogging Talmud, Mas Makis a Talmud, Mas Makis a when he was subsequently asked whether he had said that he denied it, said Rabbi God, he did say it. And furthermore, this is found in scripture and we learned it in the Mishnah too. This is written command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp and that they defile not their camp in the midst where I dwell again bearing on this we learned who while. Unclean entered the sanctuary incurs a flogging why then did he retract his statement because he found it difficult to explain the case of the ravisher as taught in the following a ravisher who put away his wife by divorce if he be a lay Israelite he can take her back without receiving a flogging but if he be a priest he receives a flogging but does not take her back now if he be a lay Israelite he takes her back without receiving a flogging why seeing that this is an instance where a negative command is preceded by a positive command why should he receive no flogging Ola said that the words she shall be his wife could have been left out in the case of the ravisher and have been inferred from a somewhat analogous case of the defaming husband thus since in the case of the defaming husband although he did no tangible act the all merciful ordained that she shall be his wife is not this injunction even more appropriate in the case of the ravisher what then is the purport of those words in the case of the ravisher consequently if they are not strictly needed at the first stage make use of them for the latter stage to indicate that if the ravisher did put her away unlawfully he must take her back but yet no inference can be drawn from the case of the defaming husband to that of the ravisher because there is a refutation namely what is the penalty of the defaming husband he is flogged as well as immerse 100 shekels which is not the case with the ravisher rather therefore argue thus the injunction she shall be his wife might have been omitted in the case of the defaming husband and inferred from the case of the ravisher thus what is the penalty of the ravisher that although he is not flogged in addition to the immersement of 50 shekels the all merciful nevertheless ordained that she shall be his wife how much more then should this be so in the case of the defaming husband why then were these words inserted if they are unnecessary in the case of the defaming husband utilize them in connection with the ravisher and again if they are not necessary for the first stage utilize them in connection with the latter stage after the ravisher had put her away yet again I say the case of the defaming husband could not be inferred from that of the ravisher because there is a counter argument namely that the ravisher has done a tangible act which cannot be said of the defaming
Against muzzling the ox replied Rabba why should the additional charge of Adu by the Almerciful minimize the force of the prohibition said our Papa if that is your view then why not say likewise in the case of the prohibition translated into remedial action why should the additional charge of Adu by the Almerciful minimize the force of the prohibition replied Rabba there the positive command comes to remove the effects of the contravention of the prohibition that explanation harmonizes with the view of those who say that the flogging depends on whether the transgressor has nullified or not nullified his chance of making redress but according to those who say that the flogging depends on whether he had carried out or not carried out the act of redress what explanation does it afford Talmud Mas Makisbi has not this explanation been given as reason for our Yohanan's view but surely it was our Yohanan himself who told Atana if he has nullified his chance of making redress he is liable and if he has not nullified it he is exempt because once a tanner resided in the presence of our Yohanan whenever a negative precept involves the fulfillment of the positive action then if the offender has carried out the positive action he is exempt if he has nullified his chance of carrying out the positive action he is liable thereupon our Yohanan corrected him saying what did you say that if he carried out the positive act he is exempt which implies that if he did not carry it out he is liable and that if he has nullified his chance of carrying out the positive act he is liable which implies that if he has not nullified his chance of carrying out the positive act he is exempt not so teach us if he has nullified it he is liable and if he has not nullified it he is exempt and Resh on the other hand says that the flogging depends on whether he the transgressor has carried out or has not carried out the requisite act of Redress what is the point at issue between them the question of a dubious warning one master taking the view that a dubious warning may be called in law warning while the other master takes the view that a dubious warning is not called in law warning and they follow each his point of view in several discussions for it has been stated if one said I take an oath that I shall eat this loaf today and the day passed and he ate it not both our Yohanan and Resh Lakish concur that he is not to be flogged our Yohanan says he is not flogged Talmud, Mas Makis because this was transgressing a prohibition without tangible action on his part and a prohibition contravened without tangible action does not involve a flogging Resh Lakish on the other hand says he is not flogged because the warning in this case is dubious in character and a dubious warning is not legally regarded as a warning and both base their views on statements of our Judas as it is taught and yet shall let nothing of it remain until the morning but that which remaineth of it till the morning ye shall burn with fire scripture comes here providing a positive act to follow in the wake of a prohibition thereby indicating that here no flogging is to be inflicted these are the words of Arjuna etc and now Arjuna argues thus the reason why no flogging is given here is only because scripture comes with the direction of a positive act after the contravened prohibition but if scripture had not come and made here the special provision he the offender would have been given a flogging this implies that a dubious warning is legally a warning Rush on the other hand argues thus the reason that no flogging is given here is because scripture comes with the direction of a positive act as following the contravened prohibition but if scripture had not come and made such provision here he would receive a flogging this implies that a prohibition contravened without Tangible action entails a flogging, but according to our Simeon Belakish, surely this too also is a good instance of dubious warning. He bases his view on this point on another statement of our Judas as it is taught if one maliciously wounded first one husband of his mothers and then the other husband of hers or invoked a divine imprecation first on the one and then on the other or wounded them both simultaneously or cursed them both simultaneously, he is liable. Our Judas says if he did so to both simultaneously, he is liable if to one after the other he is not liable. And according to our Yohanan, surely this too is a good instance of a prohibition contravened without tangible action on this particular point. Is our Yohanan's view is in accordance with what our EDB Avin stated in the name of Aram who reported our Isaac is reporting our Yohanan to have said that our Judas citing the name of our Jose the Galilean said in all prohibitions of the Torah, a prohibition involving. Tangible action entails a flogging a prohibition not involving tangible action does not entail a flogging save in the case of one who takes an oath and does not fulfill it one who commutes one gift promised to the sanctuary with another or invokes a divine imprecation on his fellow then is not one statement of Arjuna contradicting another the divergence in the statements of Arjuna's according to our Simeon B. Lakish on the question of a dubious warning may be taken as two different versions of Arjuna's original statement again the divergence in Arjuna's statements according to our Yohanan is not difficult to explain as one may be taken as his own Arjuna's view and the other as that of his master our Jose the Galilean we learned elsewhere if one takes a dam with the young Arjuna says he is flogged and he does not send the dam free but the sages say that he lets the dam go and receives no flogging this is the general principle whenever a negative command involves the fulfillment of a positive action there is no flogging for contravention are you had observed we have only this instance and one other RLAs asked him where when you find it you will know was the reply he left him made careful search and found the following as it is taught a ravisher who put away his wife by divorce if he be a lay Israelite takes her back without receiving a flogging if he be a priest he receives flogging but does not take her back now this accords well on the view that teaches the flogging depends on whether the transgressor had carried out or not carried out the act of redress but what about the view that teaches that it depends on whether he has nullified or not nullified his chance of making redress through this principle applies well enough to the case of sending away the dam but in the case of the ravisher how is the principle whether he had nullified or had not nullified his chance of making redress applicable if for instance he killed his wife he is liable to the severe penalty of death our Shimei of Mahuza suggested that for instance he accepted on her behalf a betrothal token from another man said Rab let us see if she had made him her attorney it is the woman who nullified the chance of redress and if she had not made him her attorney can he do anything of the kind it would be futile on his part but said our Shimei of Nihardia let us say for instance that he took a solemn vow publicly that he would never again lie with her that suggestion is compatible with the opinion held that a vow made publicly is not subject to formal rescission but according to the opinion that a vow made publicly is subject to formal rescission what can you then say that he made it dependent on the consensus of the public as Amimar stated the law is that a vow made in public is subject to formal rescission but if made dependent on the consensus of the public it is not subject to formal rescission and are there not other instances Nimani Larceny Plush Corner there is a case of larceny where the Almerciful ordained thou shalt not oppress withhold from thy neighbor nor rob him and then elsewhere directs that he shall restore that which he took by robbery then again there is a case of the pledge where the Almerciful ordained thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge and then follows thou shalt stand without thou shalt surely restore to him the pledge when the sun goeth down. And do not these instances fit equally well if we say that the flogging depends on whether the transgressor has carried out or not carried out the act of redress or whether he had nullified or not nullified his chance of making redress true but as amends can be made here by a monetary compensation if he destroyed the pledge he is not liable to both the flogging and compensation to this are Zeradimerd what if the pledge belonged to a proselyte who has since died Talmud, Mos Magus. Be here too the man is in fact liable to pay compensation only the title of the proselyte has lapsed with his death and is there not the instance of the corner of the field where the all-merciful ordained thou shalt not wholly reap the corner of thy field neither shalt thou gather the gleaning of thy harvest and then continues thou shalt leave them for the poor and for the stranger and this too fits equally well if we say that the flogging depends on whether the transgressor has carried out or has not carried out the act of redress or on whether he had nullified or not nullified his chance of making redress as is to be gathered from what we learned the ordinance of the corner of the field is in the first instance to leave apart some of the standing corn for the poor if he neglected to leave some of the corn standing he sets apart some of the sheep if he failed to set apart some of the sheep he leaves apart some of the grain in the heap before winnowing. Having winnowed, he should tie the grain first and then give to the poor his do no our Yohanan holds according to our Ishmael who said he can also give it in part of the dough, but even according to our Ishmael, there is still the case where the transgressor has already consumed the bread, hence this indeed is the only other instance that our Yohanan had in mind when he said we have only this instance of the bird's nest and one other, but it is not that of the ravisher who pledged himself publicly not to live with her because it is only in an optional matter that we say that a vow made dependent on the consensus of the
Swarmeth upon the earth, ye shall not eat them if a hornet on six counts, the extra count being for and all winged swarming things are unclean to you, they shall not be eaten. Rob observed that anyone confining his face of sins against, and ye shall not make your souls detestable. Rb son of Abbe observed that anyone drinking out of a cupping horn sins against, ye shall not make your souls detestable by what I have set apart for you to hold unclean. Rabbi the son of Arhuna said that. If one crush nine ants into a mash, adding thereto another live one, thus bringing up the quantity to the requisite in olive size and ate them, he renders himself liable on six counts five for the live ant as a separate creature and one for the mass as amounting to an olive size of nibble. Rab reporting Arjuhan and said it would be the same even with only two mashes and one other whole. Arjuhan reporting Arjuhan and said even only one mashed and one alive and there is no disagreement between them in principle. For one is thinking of larger and the other of smaller size insects. One who eats of people or a first tithe from which its terima has not been taken or of second tithe which has not been redeemed. Rab said that one who eats of people produced from which its poor tithe has not been taken is flogged. Whose view is followed in the statement of Rabs that of the in the following passage where it is taught. Arjuhan says it might be supposed that one. Is liable to a flogging only on eating people produced from which no do whatsoever has yet been set apart, but where, for instance, Terra Magidola has been separated, but not yet the first tithe, or the first tithe, but not yet the second tithe, or say even the poor tithe has not yet been separated, whence is derived the prohibition of eating such produce from the following instructive text: Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, or of thy wine, or of thy oil, and later. It says that they may eat within thy gates and be satisfied. What is the reference in the latter text to the poor tithe? So likewise, in the former text, references to the poor tithe and the all merciful enjoins, Thou mayest not eat of Joseph. Said Rab's point has been debated already by Tanaymar Eliezer says that in the case of Dima, there is no need even to designate and assign the poor tithe, but the sages say Talmud, Mosmachus, that one should designate it, but need not set it apart. Is not here the point at issue this that one authority the sages holds that the known presence of unseparated poor tithe in produce makes it evil while the other authority our Eliezer holds that it does not make it evil said Abay if that were the issue why raise it in connection with Dima it should have been raised in connection with produce which is known to be untithed hence it must be said all are agreed that the known presence of unseparated poor tithe does render the produce evil and the issue involved here is rather this that one authority our Eliezer takes the view that the Amhires are not suspected of withholding the poor tithe of Dima as being merely a money matter they do not fail to set it apart while the rabbis take the view that Amhires are mistrusted about it because it involves trouble and as the separation of the do means some trouble to them they will not set it apart how much of evil is one to eat to become liable our Simeon says that Mirus morsel and the sages say in olive size RBB reporting our Simeon Belakish said that this difference of opinion referred only to the grain of wheat but as to the requisite amount of flour all were agreed that it is an olive size but our Jeremiah reporting our Simeon Belakish said that there was a difference of opinion on both the amount of flour as well as the grain of wheat we learn in the Mishnah said our Simeon do you not admit that if one ate them in a test and he would be liable said they to him only because it is a separate creature said he to them even so a grain of wheat is a separate entity does not this text show that there was a dispute only about the grain of wheat but nothing about flour not so our Simeon only argues with the rabbis on their own contention my own opinion he argues is that even the same quantity of people flour is enough for entailing a flogging but even according to your contention you should admit to me that one grain of wheat is a separate entity and the rabbis reply an animate thing is of sufficient importance as to be considered a separate entity but a grain of wheat is not of such importance in a very that it is taught as our Jeremiah had reported our Simeon says that any minute quantity is sufficient to entail a flogging the olive size mentioned by the rabbis is required only to entail a sin dash offering mission one who eats of first fruits previous to the recital over them who eats of most holy meats outside the hangings of lesser holy meats or of second tithe outside the city while one who breaks a bone of a paschal lamb that is clean receives forty lashes but one who leaves of the flesh of a clean paschal lamb or breaks a bone of an unclean paschal lamb I has not given forty lashes if one takes the dam with the young Arjuna says he is flogged and need not then send the dam free but the sages say that he lets the dam go and receives no flogging this is the general Principle whenever a negative precept involves the fulfillment of some positive act, there is no flogging for its contravention. Gamara Rabbi Bibar had citing Aryohan and said that this is only the view of our Akiva who is reported anonymously, but the sages say regarding the ceremonies of the first fruits that only placing them before the altar is a bar to their consumption, but the omission of the recital is no bar to their consumption, then why not say that the above is the view of our Simeon who is reported anonymously? This is what he meant to tell us that our Akiva also held that same view as expressed by his disciple Ar Simeon, which statement of Ar Simeon have you in mind as it is taught in the raising of the hand that is the first fruit said Ar Simeon, what is the lesson intended by this text? If it is merely to forbid eating them first fruits outside the wall of Jerusalem, there is no need it follows a fortiori from the less restricted second tithe in this way. Seeing that he who eats of the less restricted second tithe outside the wall is flogged is not that flogging more deserved for eating first fruits outside the wall the text therefore can only mean to convey that he who eats them when the prescribed recital has not yet taken place is flogged nor of thy free will offerings that means not eating outside Jerusalem of thank offerings or peace offerings said our Simeon what is the lesson intended by this verse if only to forbid eating of these meats outside the wall this follows a fortiori from the second tithe as before the text therefore can only mean to convey that he who eats of the meat of thank offerings and peace offerings before the blood had been sprinkled on the altar is flogged and the firstlings that means the firstborn male animal said our Simeon what lesson is intended here if only to forbid eating of these holy meats outside the wall this too is inferred already a fortiori from the second tithe as before, if to forbid eating of the flesh before the blood had been sprinkled, this follows a fortiori from the thank offering and peace offering. The text therefore can only mean to convey that a layman who eats of the first ling even after the ritual blood sprinkling receives a flogging of thy herd or thy flock that alludes to sin offerings and guilt offerings. Said our Simeon, what is the implied injunction here? If only against eating of these outside the wall, this follows a fortiori from the second tithe. As before, if against partaking of these before the blood sprinkling on the altar, this already follows a fortiori from the thank offering and peace offering. As before, if against any layman eating of sin offerings or guilt offering even after the ritual blood sprinkling on the altar, this already follows a fortiori from the law of the first ling. The text therefore can only mean to convey that if a priest eats of sin and guilt offerings even after the ritual blood. Sprinkling outside the hangings, he transgresses and receives a flogging, nor any of thy vows that refers to burnt offering. Said Arsimian, what is the implied injunction here? If only against eating of these outside the wall, this already follows a fortiori from the second tithe as before. If against eating of these before the blood sprinkling, it already follows a fortiori from the thank offering and peace offering as before. If against any lamb eating of these same after the ritual blood sprinkling, it already follows a fortiori from the law of the first ling as before. If against priests eating of these outside the hangings, it follows a fortiori from the sin and guilt offerings. The text therefore means to convey Talmud, Mos Machis be that he who eats of the burnt offering after the blood sprinkling on the altar, even within the hangings, is flogged. Said Rabbi, this is ingenious. May every bearing mother bear a child like Arsimian, and if not quite like him, should she not? Bear any at all though his fortiori arguments may be refuted for instance in what respect is it assumed that first fruits are of graver importance than second tithe and that first fruits are forbidden to lay people non-priests but is not the second tithe rather of graver importance because second tithe is forbidden to the one and the argument is thus unsound again in what respect is it assumed that thank and peace offerings are of graver importance than second tithe and that these have also the offering of blood and a certain prescribed portions of fat etc on the altar but is not the second tithe rather of graver importance because second tithe may be redeemed only with coin silver money and no other again in what respect do you assume is the first ling of graver importance than thank and peace
A penalty derived by logical deduction is warranted. Do not recognize a prohibition based on logical deduction. No Arsimian desired to demonstrate mere prohibition in each case, but did not Rabbis say that according to Arsimian, any layperson eating of the flesh of burnt offering before the sprinkling of the blood and outside the wall of Jerusalem is flogged on five counts. He only meant to say five mere prohibitions were involved in this one act of eating, but then have we not learned? These incur judicial flogging, etc. Talmud, Mas Makis, but yet the text is tautological, consider it having been written already, and thither ye shall bring, and there ye shall eat before the Lord thy God. Could not the All Merciful have proceeded briefly, thus thou mayest not eat them within thy gates? What else then could be the purpose of the All Merciful in having them all restated in detail, save to stress separately the prohibition attaching to every instance of the above text stated? Rabbis said that according to our Simeon, any layperson eating of the flesh of burnt offering before the sprinkling of the blood and outside the wall of Jerusalem is flogged on five counts, should he not be flogged on a sixth count arising out of the text, and they shall eat those things wherewith atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them, but a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy, no, as that prohibition bears on such meat as was permitted for priests to eat. While that referred to in Rabbis' statement is not proper even for priests, and should he not be flogged on the strength of the text, and ye shall be holy men unto me, therefore ye shall not eat any flesh in the field like torn of beasts, which is taken to imply that any holy flesh that has got beyond its partition is forbidden, no, as that applies to meat available when within the partition, whereas here in Rabbis' case it is not available even while within the partition, and should. He not also be flogged on the strength of our Eliezer's interpretation for our Eliezer said the words it shall not be eaten because it is holy conveyed Talmud, Mas Makis be that the text means to declare as forbidden any sort of holy meat which has become disqualified no as here too it can only refer to meat that was available before becoming disqualified whereas here in Rabbi's statement the meat was not available even before it became disqualified and should he not also be flogged on. The strength of that other interpretation of our Eliezer as it is taught our Eliezer says that the words it shall be holy made to smoke it shall not be eaten impose a negative command against the eating of anything that is ordered to be holy burnt just so and it is on this interpretation of the text that he based his statement Arhidal citing Rab said Kusa that a priest who ate of a sin offering or guilt offering before the sprinkling of the blood is flogged the reason for this is. Rit says and Aaron and his sons shall eat of those things wherewith atonement was made which implies that they are to be eaten only after ritual atonement has been made but not before atonement has been made this being an instance of a negative command implied in a positive command which is tantamount to a negative robber raised objection from the following and every beast that partake the hoof and hath the hoof holy cloven into two and shook the cut among the beasts that yet may eat implies that ye may eat but you may not eat another beast now if the principle be as you stated what further need to continue but these ye shall not eat of them that only chew the cut and of them that only have the hoof cloven we must therefore say that if the reported dictum be a fact it must have been worded thus our giddle citing rap said that a stranger layman who ate of a sin offering or guilt offering before the sprinkling of the blood is exempt the reason for this the Text says, and they shall eat of those things wherewith atonement was made. That is, anyone to whom the former part of the text, the positive command, and they shall eat of those things wherewith atonement has been made, applies to him the latter part of the text, the negative command. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. Applies also, and vice versa. Anyone to whom the former part of the text, and they shall eat of those things wherewith atonement has been made, does not apply to him the latter part of the text. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. Does not apply. Our Elias reporting our Hashai said regarding the ceremonies of first fruits that the omission to place them before the altar is a bar to their release, but the omission of the recital is not a bar. But did our Elias actually say that? Did not our Elias reporting our Hashai say that if a man had set apart his first fruits before the feast of tabernacles and it? Feast passed without these fruits having been presented before the altar, they are left to rot. Now, what is the implication here? Is it not that they are to be left to rot because it is no longer the period for the recital over them? If then you suppose that the omission of the recital is not a bar, why are they to be left to rot in accordance with the principle enunciated by Arzara? For Arzara said, wherever the conditions for mingling oil with the flour for a meal offering are present, the omission of the mingling is not a bar, but where the conditions are not present, the omission of mingling is a bar. Arahabi Jacob taught the same lesson as a statement of RC reporting our Yohanan and thus made one statement of our Yohanan clash with another. Did our Yohanan say regarding the ceremonies of first fruits that the omission to place them before the altar is a bar to their release, but the omission of the recital is not a bar? Why would RC ask of our Yohanan how soon? Were the first fruits permitted to be partaken of by the priests? Did he not reply that those that had come at the proper time for the recital were released immediately after the recital, and those that were not brought at the proper time for the recital were released immediately? They had come face to face with the temple. A statement which clashes on both points in regard to recital as well as to placing them before the altar as regards the recital. It is not difficult to explain the seeming discrepancy. One statement represents the view of our Simeon, while the other is according to the rabbis. Again, as regards placing them before the altar, it is not difficult to explain the seeming discrepancy. One statement is according to our Judah, while the other is that held by the rabbis. What statement of our Judah have you in mind? It is the following as it is taught. Our Judah says, and the priest shall take the basket out of thy hand and set it down before the altar. This refers to. The ritual of waving you say that it refers to the ritual of waving or maybe it only means setting them down ordinarily as however later it is said and thou shalt set it down before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God the ordinary setting down of the fruit is already indicated what then is the meaning of the former injunction and the priest shall take the basket out of thy hand and set it down before the altar it can only refer to the ritual waving and who is it? Tana that does not concur with our Judah it is our Eliezer B. Jacob as it is taught and the priest shall take the basket out of thy hand out of thy hand indicates that the waving is an essential part of the ceremony these are the words of our Eliezer B. Jacob what is the reason of our Eliezer B. Jacob it is derived from the occurrence of the word hand both here and in connection with the peace offerings in this way here it is written and the priest shall take the basket out of thy hand and there it is written his own hands shall bring the offering unto the Lord just as here the priest is the recipient so there the priest is the recipient just as there the owner tender so here the owner tenders how is it done in each case the priest puts his hand under those of the worshipper and waves them Rabin B. Adder reported our Isaac to have said in the case of first fruits Talmud, Mas Makisa when does the penalty begin from the time that these come face to face with the temple? Whose is the view expressed here that of the Tana mentioned in the following as it is taught our Eliezer says as regards first fruits if some are left outside the wall of Jerusalem and some are taken within those that are still outside are like ordinary fruits in every respect while those within are to be treated like things of the sanctuary in every respect are she's hate said in regard to first fruits the omission to place them before the altar is a bar to their release but the Omission of the recital is not a bar whose is of you expressed here that of the following ten as it is taught our Jose reports three things in the name of three elders the statement being one of them our Ishmael says that one might presume that even nowadays although there is no temple a person must bring a second tithe to Jerusalem and eat it there as such instead of redeeming it but there is this argument against it firstlings must be brought to Jerusalem the appointed place even a second tithe must be brought to Jerusalem the appointed place now what is requisite in the case of firstlings they may not be eaten there save when there is a temple and the same obtains in regard to second tithe that it should not be eaten there save when there is a temple this is not conclusive because in the case of firstlings there are requisite specific altar rites the sprinkling of blood and the burning of certain prescribed portions of fat but then I ask let first fruits support my contention to this. We may reply what is requisite in the case of the first fruits, they too must be placed before the altar. Here then comes the instructive text, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and the firstlings of thy herd, and of thy flock, wherein second tithe and firstlings are set side by side, showing that what obtains in firstlings, namely that they may not be eaten
And if he deems the first dedication to have been efficient only for the nonce and not for all time to come, then the same question arises in regard to the first links as to the second tithe. Said Rabban and Dr. Ishmael deemed the first dedication efficient for the nonce and not for all time to come. And here, in deriving the rule of the tithe from that of a first ling, he is thinking of some particular incident of the first ling where the ritual blood sprinkling on the altar had been performed just before the destruction of the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, the flesh was still left unconsumed by the priests. And we compare the flesh to the blood thereof. Just as for sprinkling of the blood, there is need of the presence of the altar. So for the eating of the flesh, there is need of the existence of the altar, not otherwise. And then again, we compare second tithes to first lings, but can a ruling inferred by analogy be employed in matters appertaining to hallowed? Things as basis of inference for a further analogy, the tithe of corn, wine, and oil is considered non hallowed Talmud. Mas Macus B. This reply to the objection raised is satisfactory according to the view that we follow the derived point, but what of the view that we follow the instructive point as well? Again, no difficulty here as blood and flesh in this case are one and the same thing, being of the same animal who eats of most holy meats outside the hangings of lesser holy meats or of second tithe outside the city wall. Have we not already learned this in the former mission? And who eats of second tithe or of sanctuary gifts unredeemed? Said our Jose B. Had in the latter mission refers to a second tithe that is clean and to a person in a clean state who unlawfully eats thereof unredeemed outside the city wall, whereas the former mission to a second tithe that is unclean and to a person in an impure state who ate unlawfully of it unredeemed within. Jerusalem now where do we find in holy writ that eating of second tithe in impurity renders one liable as it is taught our Simeon says the text neither have I put away thereof being unclean implies neither have I eaten of it while I was unclean and the tithe clean nor while I was clean and the tithe defiled and where is the admonition not to eat it I know not you know not is not eating of holy meats during personal impurity explicitly prescribed the soul that touch it any such unclean things shall be unclean until the even and shall not eat of the hallowed things until but I meant its own defilement it is written thou mayest not eat within thy gates and later it is said the unclean and the clean may eat together as the gazelle and the heart and the school of our Ishmael taught that this means that even a clean person and one who is unclean may eat meat of a blemished firstling out of the same platter without scribble thus does the all merciful direct that what is allowed you elsewhere for the clean beside the unclean to eat thereof together does not apply here where thou mayest not eat and again whence is it derived that second tithe which has become defiled is redeemable even within Jerusalem even as our Eliezer said how can it be shown that second tithe which has become defiled may be redeemed even at Jerusalem from the instructive text and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place that he shall choose the tithe of thy corn and if the way be too long for thee if thou art not able to bring it up then shalt thou turn it into money and the expression as to bring it up means in this connection only eating as in the passage and portions Masoth were brought forward unto them Joseph's brothers from before him Joseph RBB citing RC said whence could it be shown that clean second tithe may be redeemed even within one pace of the wall outside Jerusalem from what is said when thou art not able to Bring it up and shalt thou turn it into money, but is the text not claimed for the point already made by our Eliezer were that the only lesson intended the text should have said when thou art not able to eat it? Why was that unusual expression as not able to bring it up used? Am I to take it then entirely in the sense suggested by you know as that another term and tell unable to take the load might have been used? What then does the special term as convey it suggests? Both meanings are Hannah and Arhashai sat and raised the following question What would be the case where a pilgrim had just reached the very entrance to Jerusalem? Obviously, when he is outside and is charged inside, he cannot redeem as the partitions walls have already taken in the charge, but when he is within and is charged still outside, what is the law there upon a certain aged scholar imparted to them a teaching of the school of our Simeon BOA to this effect if the place is far? From the turn it into money the word Mimeka from the implies thy amplitude our papa raised the question what if he being within the entrance carries his load on a stick behind him the question is left over who eats of second tithe outside the city wall R.C. citing our Yohanan said when does the liability begin for eating of second tithe outside the city wall as soon as it has once come within sight of the interior wall the reason because one text reads and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God the tithe of thy corn and again it is written thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn we say that wherever the former command eat before the Lord thy God becomes applicable the other thou mayest not eat within thy gates becomes applicable and vice versa wherever the former command eat before the Lord thy God has not become applicable there too the other thou mayest not eat within thy gates is not applicable an objection. Against this exposition was raised from the following our Jose said if a priest picks a fig out of people produce and before eating says let the terramah thereof be situated somewhere near the peduncle stock the first tithe thereof in its northern left part the second tithe thereof in its southern right part this being in a year when second tithe is due and he being then in Jerusalem or let the poor tithe thereof be in its southern side he being then in the country adjoining if he then eats the fig Talmud, Mas Macus he incurs a flogging on one count and if he be a layman non-priest he is flogged on two counts whereas had he eaten it straightway without specifying the several dues he the layman would have been liable only on one count now the reason that a layman is said to be liable on two counts is because he ate in Jerusalem but supposing he had done it in the country adjoining he would have incurred a flogging on three counts that is to say he would be liable even though the fig with its comprised quota of second tithe had not come within sight of the interior wall of Jerusalem. No, we assume that he had brought it into Jerusalem and taken it out again. If so, I ask what is the object of our Jose's statement? I would suggest that the case he has in mind is where one had taken his fruits in temple condition to Jerusalem. Our Jose being of opinion that gifts not yet segregated are regarded as virtually segregated, but does our Jose hold? Gifts not yet segregated are regarded as virtually segregated. Why it is taught our Simeon B. Judah says in the name of our Jose that Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel were not in disagreement about fruits that were not yet completely ready for tithing if they were taken in transit through Jerusalem, that the comprised quota of second tithe in them may be redeemed and the fruits may then be eaten anywhere where they did differ was about fruits that were completely ready for tithing and were taken in. Transit through Jerusalem Beth Shammai saying that the comprised quota of second tithe in them should be brought back to Jerusalem and be eaten there while Beth Hillel say that the comprised quota should be redeemed and may be eaten anywhere now if you suppose that our Jose considers comprised gifts not yet segregated are as virtually segregated how could such redeemed dues be eaten anywhere seeing that they have been received within the city walls said rather the power of the city walls to place an embargo on the eating of second tithe within is recognized by the scriptures whereas its power of seizing is only rabbinical and the rabbis declared an embargo only to second tithe over but if it is still merged in people they made no embargo Robin has suggested that the first objection raised might be met by supposing the reference to be to a man carrying his bundle of second tithe on a stick behind him and this by the way might offer a solution to the problem raised by our papa mission if a man makes a baldness on his head or rounds the corner of his head or mars the corner of his beard or makes one cutting in his flesh for the dead he is liable to a flogging if he makes one cutting for five dead or five cuttings for one he is liable severally for each one on rounding the head he is liable for two corners one for one side and one for the other on marring the beard he is liable for two corners on one side for two on the other side and for one lower down our Eliezer says if they were all taken off as one he is liable only on one count and he is only liable on taking off with a razor our Eliezer says even if he picks off the hairs with tweezers or removes them with pincers he is liable Gemara our rabbis taught it is written that the priest shall not make bald on their head one might presume that if he made four or five bald patches he would be liable only on one count we are therefore told the baldness to teach that he is Liable on each and every bald patch what is the special import of on their head in this passage as it is written elsewhere ye shall not cut yourselves nor make a baldness between your eyes for the dead one might presume that it means he should only be liable for making a baldness between the eyes alone how is it shown that the prohibition extends to anywhere on the entire head by the expression on their head that is the prohibition extends to anywhere on the entire head I have here
The one admonition refers to each finger separately and how much constitutes a baldness. Arhuna says enough to show the bare scalp. Arhuna says in the name of Arlias or son of Arsimian, it is about the size of a bean. These statements correspond to different ten statements. How much constitutes a baldness about the size of a bean? Others say enough to show the bare scalp. Rav Judah Bihab observed that three ten aim different on that point. One saying the size of a bean, another saying large enough to show the bare scalp, and yet another saying the removal of two hairs, at least some delete two hairs and substitute about the size of a lentil. As a mnemonic, use the following machinate phrase: If a leprous bright spot is of the size of a half and bean, and quick flesh of the size of a lentil encircles it, etc. A tenant taught one who removes on the Sabbath a scissors nip of hair is liable for a sin offering. And how much is a scissors nip? Said Rav Judah to. Hairs, but was it not taught that two hairs are the minimum for a baldness? Then take it as meaning, and the same minimum obtains in the case of a baldness. It is likewise taught in another very the one who removes on the Sabbath a scissors nip of hair is liable to a sin offering. And how much is a scissors nip? Two hairs are Eliezer says even one hair. Yet the sages can see to our Eliezer where one picks out white hair from the black that he is liable even for one. And this thing is forbidden even on weekdays because it comes under what is said. And a man shall not put on a woman's garment or rounds the corner of his head. Or rabbis taught the corner of his head is the extreme end on one's head, and what is rounding the extreme end on his head if he levels his temple growth from the back of his ears to the far day tender recited in the presence of Arhista. The one who rounds the corners and the one who has them rounded are equally liable to a flogging. Said Arhista. To him does a fellow who eats dates from a seed get a flogging should anyone ask whose view that is tell him it is our Judah's view who says the contravention of a prohibition involving no tangible action entails a flogging Rabbah suggested that the dictum may refer to one who crops himself rounding off the corners of his head and that would harmonize with either view or as he suggested it might refer to one who assists the hairdresser and this too harmonizes with either view or Mars. The corner of his beard or rabbis taught the corner of his beard means the end of his beard and what is the end of his beard the tuft of his beard or makes one cutting in the flesh for the dead or rabbis taught it is written ye shall not make a cutting in your flesh one might presume that he is liable even for cutting himself on the collapse of his house or on the foundering of his ship at sea we are therefore told for a soul that is to say he is liable only on cutting himself for the dead alone and whence is it shown that one who makes five cuttings in his flesh for one dead is liable on each and every cutting we learn it from the words a cutting that is to make one liable for every cutting our Jose says whence can it be shown that one who makes one cutting for five dead is liable on each of the five dead from the instructive text for a soul which indicates that one is liable for every soul but have you not already made use of this text for excluding from this category one who cut himself on the collapse of his house or on the foundering of his ship at sea Talmud, Mosmach is a yes but our Jose takes the two terms used Sarada and Gedida as having the same import and in the case of the latter it is said for the dead Samuel said one who cuts himself with an instrument is liable an objection against this was raised from the following Sarada and Gedida are one and the same thing save that Sarada is done with the hand while Gedida is done. With an instrument, he Samuel shares the view of our Jose Tan recited in the presence of our Yohan and one who cuts himself for the dead, whether with the hand or with instrument, is liable to a flogging if he does so as an idolatrous practice. If with hand he is liable, if with instrument he is exempt. But is it not written of the priests of Baal the other way about and they cut themselves after their manner with swords and lances, but rather say if with the hand he is exempt, if with an instrument he is liable on rounding the head, he is liable for two corners, one for one side and one for the other. Arshesh pointed them out between the two lateral joints of the head on marring the beard, he is liable for two corners on the side, for two on the other side, and for one lower down. Arshesh pointed them out between the several junctions of the beard. Our Eliezer says if they were all taken off as one, he is liable only on one count, that is, he considers the whole. Process is comprised under the one prohibition and he is only liable on taking off with a razor. Our rabbis taught it is written neither shall they the priests shave off the corner of their beard. One might suppose that he is liable even if he removed it with scissors. We are therefore told neither shall thou mar destroy reading neither shall thou mar. One might suppose that he is liable even if he picked off the hairs with tweezers or with pincers. We are therefore told they shall not shave to show that it must be shaving that involves destruction which is the kind of shaving that involves destruction. You must say it is that done by the use of the razor. Our Eliezer says even if he picks off the hairs with tweezers or pincers he is liable. However you wish to take the statement it is difficult if he received on tradition the gazura shawah he should insist only on the razor as a forbidden instrument if on the other hand he does not receive on tradition the gazura. Shawah he should not permit even scissors indeed he did receive on tradition the Gezerah Shawah but he considers the process of those instruments practically as shaving Mishnah he who writes an incised imprint in his flesh is flogged if he writes on his flesh without incising or incises his flesh without imprinting he is not liable he is not liable until he writes an imprint's incision with ink I paint or anything that marks Arsimian B. Judah says in the name of Arsimian B. Yohei that he is not liable until he has written there the name as it is said nor put on you any written imprint I am the Lord Gemara said Araha the son of Rabbah to Arashi does it mean not until he has actually inscribed the words I am the Lord no reply he it means as Barkaper taught this he is not liable to a flogging until he inscribed the name of some profane deity as it is said nor put on you any written imprint I am the Lord that is I am the Lord and no other Armachia has. Citing our Adabi Agabah said it is prohibited to powder one's wound with burnt wood ash because it gives the appearance of an incised imprint. Arnam and the son of Rika said spitmates and follicles were subjects of comment by Armachia while the Belora tresses with ash and cheeses were subjects of comment by Armachia. Our Papa said Machia comments on our Mishnah and other Mishnahs while Armachia comments on reported pronouncements. Your mnemonic for this is the Mishnahs Armachia the Queens. What is the difference between the two? The point of mates RBBB Abe was particular even about powdering the scorings of the cupping instruments. Arashi observed that this was going too far as wherever there is a wound, the wound attests the man's purpose. Mishnah if a Nazi right has been drinking wine all day, he is liable once only if they said to him, Drink not wine, drink not wine, and he drank each time he is liable on each instance if he has been defiling himself for the dead all. Day he is liable once only if they said to him defile not yourself defile not yourself and he did defile himself each time he is liable on each instance if he was shaving all day he is liable once only if they said to him shave not shave not and he did shave each time he is liable on each instance if one wears a garb of linsey woolsey all day he is liable once only if they said to him do not put it on do not put it on and he takes it off and puts it on he is liable on each instance. Talmud, Mosmachus bit is possible for one to plow but one furrow and become liable thereby for eight prohibited acts if he plots with an ox and ass yoke together and these were animals of the sanctuary the plow being drawn over diverse mixed seeds sown in a vineyard during the sabbatical year on a festival day the plow for being a priest and a Nazi right and the plot being situated on a defiled area Hanania Bihakane I suggest also that he may have been wearing then linsey. Wolsey said they to him this last is not of the same category said he to them nor is the Nazi right in the same category Gemara and he takes it off and puts it on set RBB as citing RC not necessarily actually taking it off and putting it on but even if he only put his hand in and out of the armhole Araha the son of Rika illustrated it as requiring to get into the coat and to get out of it Arashi says even if he only wore it long enough to put it on and to take it off he becomes liable it is possible to plow but one furrow and become liable said Arjana a decision by vote was taken at a certain rabbinical convention that he who only covers over diverse seeds with earth makes himself liable to a flogging said are you had and to him is that not learned in our mission it is possible to plow but one furrow and become liable thereby for eight prohibited acts if he plots with an ox and ass yoke together and these are the chattels of the sanctuary over Diverse seeds sown in a vineyard, etc. Now, how does he make himself liable by plowing for sowing diverse seeds unless it is by covering them over with the clods as he proceeds with the plow? Your Jane
That Abbe, however, raised an objection against him, saying, But is not the principle of distributive liability for different kinds of work held applicable also to festivals? Is it not taught one who on a festival day boils the sciatic sinew in milk and eats it incurs a flogging on five counts? I for eating the sinew, two for unnecessary cooking on a festival day, three for boiling the sinew in milk, four for eating meat with milk, Talmud, Moss Macus A and B for kindling fire. Now, if it is as you suggested, he should not be flogged for kindling the fire as he is already held liable for cooking it the sinew, then perhaps remove kindling from this text and substitute eating sinew of a instead. But then is it not taught by our high on the same point? He is flogged for eating it on two counts and on three counts for boiling it. Now, if it be amended as you suggest, he would be liable on three counts for eating it, but take out kindling on festival day and put instead. Kindling firewood from an Asher and as to the requisite for warning to justify a flogging it is contained in the verse and there shalt cleave not of the accursed thing to thy hand said Araha the son of Rabba to our Ashi should he then not also incur a flogging on account of and thou shalt not bring an abomination into thy house but here we deal with the case where he cooked it with firewood belonging to the sanctuary and as to requisite for warning it is contained in the following two texts and burn their Asher and with fire and on the other hand ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God to this Arash I demurred why not include in the list also one who sows in a rough valley the requisite for warning being contained in the words which shall neither be ploughed nor sown our hand and demurred why not include also if he erased with plough the divine name inscribed on something whilst proceeding with it the requisite for warning being found in the words and ye shall destroy their name out of that place ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God Arabah Demurd why not include also one who cuts away a leper's bright spot the requisite for warning being contained in the words take heed in the plague of leprosy that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the priest beloved shall teach you Abah Demurd why not include also one who loosened the breastplate of the high priest from the ephod and also one who removed the staves from their rings on the ark the requisite for warnings being they shall not be taken from it and that the breastplate be not loosed Arashi Demurd why not include also one who plowed with sticks taken from an asher tree the forewarning being and there shall cleave not of the accursed thing to thy hand Rabah Demurd why not include also one who cuts down good fruit trees whilst proceeding with the plow the forewarning being for thou mayest eat of them but thou shalt not cut them down said R. Zeira to Armani why not include also the case of one who solemnly swore I shall not plow on the festival day in that case the oath has no application because he stands already adjured by the law of Sinai then said he or Zeira to him supposing he had sworn I shall not plow at all be it weekday or festival day in which case as the oath is valid for a weekday it attaches incidentally also to the festival day the Tana does not mention anything for which absolution may be obtained but does he not behold there is the mention of animals of the sanctuary I explained that to refer to a firstling and what about the mention of a Nazirite that refers to a Samson Nazirite a Samson Nazirite is he depart from defiling himself to the dead but say that the Tana of this mission does not admit the principle of his circle or said if a votivox that had become disqualified for sacrifice were to be used for covering a female for breeding the person using it so is Liable to a flogging on two counts are Isaac similarly observed that if one drives works of Odevox that had become disqualified for sacrifice he becomes liable to a flogging for working it for although the animal is physically one body holy writ has by its restrictions legally placed it in the category of two diverse bodies mission and how many lashes are given him 40 save one as it is said by number 40 which means a number coming up to 40 are Judah says he is given 40 lashes in full and where is the additional lash applied between his shoulders when they estimate the number of lashes he can stand it must be a number divisible by three if they estimated him capable of receiving 40 and after receiving some Talmud, Mos Macus B they again estimated him as not capable of enduring 40 he is exempted from the rest if they estimated him fit to receive 18 and after he received the same they again estimated him as fit for receiving 40 save. One he is exempted from the rest of our and how many lashes are given 40 save one what is the reason for this particular number if it were written 40 in number I should have said it means actually 40 in number but as the order of the wording is by number 40 it means a number coming up to the 40 Rob observed how dull with are those other people who stand up in deference to the scroll of the Torah but do not stand up in deference to a great personage because while in the Torah scroll 40 lashes are prescribed the rabbis come and by interpretation reduce them by one our Judah says 40 lashes in full and where is the additional lash applied between the shoulders said our Isaac what is our Judah's reason it is written and one shall say what are these wounds between thine hands then he shall answer I was beaten in the house of my friends and the rabbis what say they to this that say they is written in reference to the punishment of school Children when they estimate the number of lashes he can stand it must be a number divisible by three if after receiving some they again estimated him he is exempt that is exempt only after he had received some but if he has not yet received any of the first sentence he is not granted that consideration but this is contradicted by the following if they estimated him fit for 40 and then again estimated him unfit for receiving 40 he is exempt if they estimated him fit for receiving 18 and then again estimated him fit for receiving 40 he is exempt from the rest said Arshis hate this is not difficult to explain here in the mission they estimated his fitness for the same day while there in the very decided they estimated his fitness for the next or some other day mission if he committed a transgression which offended against two prohibitions and they made one estimate for both he takes his scourging and is quit if not he is flogged for one Transgression is allowed to recover and then is flogged again tomorrow but is it not taught one infliction of lashes is not a judge for two prohibitions said Arshis hate this is not difficult to explain in one case it is where they assigned him 41 lashes while this mission appears on a case where they assigned him 42 lashes mission how do they scourge him his two hands are tied to a post on either side of it the superintendent of the synagogue lays hold of his garments if they are torn they are torn if they are ripped open they are ripped open until he exposes the offender's chest a stone is placed behind the offender on which the superintendent of the synagogue stands over him holding in his hand a strap of calf hide made of one thong one folded into two and the two into four and other two thongs running as it were up and down the half is a hand breadth in length and the thongs with a hand breadth its tip reaching to the edge of the abdomen he Administers one third of the lashes in front and two thirds behind. He lashes him not in a standing or sitting posture, but stooping as it is said. And the judge shall cause him to fall, stoop down, and have him beaten. He who administers the lashes smites with his one hand and with his whole force. While the one who recites says, "If thou wilt not observe to do, then the Lord thy God shall make thy strokes pronounced and the strokes of thy seed, etc." And he goes back again to the beginning of it. Text if necessary and concludes with, "But he being full of compassion forgiveth iniquity and destroyeth not. Yet many a time doth he turn his anger away and doth not stir up all his wrath." And again returns to the text. Observe therefore the words of this covenant and do them that ye may make all that ye do to prosper. If the offender dies under his hand stroke, he is exempt from penalty. If he gave him one more lash and the offender died, he goes into banishment. If the offender befouled himself. Either with faces or urine he is discharged. Our Judah says faces in the case of a man and urine in the case of a woman. Talmud, Mos Macus Gemara. How do they scourge him? His two hands are tied to a post. His garments, if they are torn, they are torn until he exposes the offender's chest. What is the reason for this? The implication of the words and thy brother become debased. A strap of calf hide said Arshis hate in the name of our Elias or Bezerai. Whence may it be deduced that the strap is to be of calf hide? It is written forty lashes shall he strike him and in proximity to it thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth the corn. Arshis hate said also in the name of our Elias or Bezerai. Whence may it be shown that a Yabamah who has become liable to marry a Yabam smitten with boils should not be muzzled to voice her descent from the marriage. It is written thou shalt not muzzle the ox and in proximity to it if brethren dwell together, etc. And this also said Arshis hate in the Name of our Eliezer B. Ezra to disregard the appointed seasons is like practicing idolatry because it is written thou shalt make thee no molten gods and next to it is the ordinance of the festivals the feast of unleavened bread shalt thou keep etc. And our she's hate further said in the name of our Eliezer B.
Required he administers one third of the lashes in front and two thirds behind. What scriptural ground is there for the said Arkahana? The words of the text and the judge shall cause him to fall and have him beaten before him according to the measure of his wickedness by number that is one third of his wickedness on the front and two thirds on his back. They lash him not standing or sitting but stooping. Said are his is reporting are you hand may it be shown that the strap is to be folded from the wording in the text and the judge shall cause it to fall and cause it to strike him. But is the passage not needed to tell us about the posture of the man himself if only that the more appropriate expression Yatehu and he shall cause him to bend might have been written there? What then is the import of the peculiar expression Hippolo he shall cause it to fall to indicate both instructions he who administers the lashes does it with one hand etc. Our rabbis. Taught only men lacking in physical vigor and abounding in knowledge are appointed as superintendents. Our Judah says even men lacking in knowledge and abounding in physical vigor said Rabbi. Our Judah's view seems the more logical because it is written there. Forty he shall have him beaten. He shall not exceed lest he exceed. Now if you say that the superintendents are men lacking in knowledge, then I understand that such a warning is necessary. But if you say that only men abounding in knowledge may be appointed as superintendents, is such a warning necessary? And what say the rabbis to this? They say we caution only those who are cautious of themselves. Attend a taught when he raises the lash, he raises it with both hands so as to raise it all the higher. And when he smites, he smites with one hand so that it comes down of itself vehemently. And he who recites the scriptural verses says, etc. Our rabbis taught the most prominent of the judges recites the scriptural verses. It. Second counts the strokes and the third says strike him when the beating is of many strokes he lengthens the recital and when the beating is less he shortens the recital but do we not learn he goes back to the beginning of the verse the rule is that he should time the recital to correspond precisely with the lashing but if he has not been so precise he goes back again to the beginning of the verse our rabbis taught it is written he shall not exceed an ample beating from this I gather that only an ample beating is forbidden once do I learn that not even a slight beating in excess of the determined number of strokes is permissible from the instructive words he shall not exceed if so what is the import of the phrase an ample beating this phrase implies that the former imposed number of strokes were in themselves an ample beating if he befouled himself etc our rabbis taught the offender whether man or woman is discharged on losing faces but not urine these are the words of our Mayor Arjuna says a man is discharged on losing faces and a woman on losing urine, but the sages say man and woman alike are discharged on losing faces or urine, but then is it not also taught Arjuna says the offender whether man or woman is discharged on losing faces said Arnam and B. Isaac there is no contradiction as the latter citation merely states that in regard to faces it is the same in the case of man or woman Samuel said if they had tied him down to the post and he broke away and escaped from the court he is exempt what is the reason because of the text lest he be dishonored and he has been dishonored an objection was raised if he befouled himself either at the first or at the second stroke they let him go if the thong snapped at the second stroke they let him go but at the first stroke they do not let him go now why not at the first stroke why not let him go as if he had escaped because there he actually ran away whereas here he has not run away our rabbis taught if they estimate him that he would befoul himself as soon as they applied the lash they let him go if that he would befoul himself on coming away from the court they give the flogging not only this but even if he broke down at the very first they flog him because the text reads and he shall cause him to be beaten he shall not exceed lest thy brother be disannured before thine eyes implying but not if he had already been disannured while at court. Mission all who have incurred the penalty of Karath on being flogged obtain remission from their punishment of Karath for it is said forty he shall have him beaten he shall not exceed lest thy brother shall be disannured before thine eyes which shows that on having received the flogging he is considered thy brother these are the words of our Hanani be Gamaliel and said our Hanani be Gamaliel if in one transgression a transgressor forfeits his soul how much more should one who performs one Precept have his soul granted him our Simeon says that you can learn this from its own passage for it is said therefore whosoever shall do any of these abominations even the souls that do them shall be cut off from among their people and there in the preamble it says Talmud, Mos Magus Bia shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinances which if a man do he shall live by them which means that one who desists from transgressing is granted reward like one who performs a precept are. Simeon B. Rabbi says behold holy writ says only be steadfast in not eating the blood and thou shalt not eat the life with the flesh that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee when thou shalt do what is right in the eyes of the Lord now if in the case of blood for which man's soul has a loathing anyone who refrains therefrom receives reward how much more so in regard to robbery and incest for which man's soul has a craving and longing shall one who refrains therefrom. Acquire merit for himself and for generations and generations to come to the end of all generations are Hanani Biakashia says the Holy One blessed be he desired to make Israel worthy therefore gave he them the law to study and many commandments to do for it is said the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to make the law great and glorious Gemara said are you Hanan are Hanani Bigamaliel's colleagues disagree with him said are Adabi Ahab at Rab's college they used to say we learn in a Mishnah there is no difference in sanctity between Sabbath and the day of atonement save that in the case of the former a deliberate desecration is punishable by human agency while in that of the latter a deliberate desecration is punished by Garth now were this doctrine of our Hanani Bigamaliel generally accepted the Mishnah would have said that the punishment of deliberate desecration in either case of Sabbath or day of atonement is practically left to human agency said Arnaman. B. Isaac, whose view made that mission express it is our Isaacs, for he says that there is no penalty of flogging for those liable to Karath, as it was taught, seeing that Holy Writ has already comprehended in a single verse all the offenders in unlawful relations as being liable to Karath. What object was there in singling out that penalty in the case of the brother with his sister only to show that Karath is their penalty, not flogging our Ashi said you might even say that the cited Misha expresses the opinion of the rabbis by explaining that it states that in one case the Sabbath its main punishment is delegated to human authority, whereas in the other the day of atonement it is left to the celestial authority. Our Adai Rab said that Halach arrests with our Hanani B. Gamaliel said our Joseph who has gone up to heaven and come back with this information said Abbe to him, but then in regard to what our Joshua B. Levi said, three things were enacted by the mundane. Tribunal below and the celestial tribunal on high have given assent to their action. We might also exclaim who has gone up to heaven and come back with this information. Only we obtain these points by interpreting certain texts, and in this instance too, we so interpret the text to turn to the main text. Our Joshua B. Levi said that three things were enacted by the mundane tribunal below and the celestial tribunal on high gave assent to their action. These were the annual recital of it. Scroll of Esther saluting with the divine name and the Levites tied to be brought to the temple chamber. The annual recital of the scroll of Esther as it is written, they confirmed and the Jews took upon them and their seed, etc. They confirmed above what they had taken upon themselves below saluting with the divine name as it is written, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you, and furthermore it says, The Lord bless thee, thou mighty man of Valor what is the purport of and furthermore it says lest you should say that Boaz did this of his own idea and that this action of his was not approved by heaven come and hear what it says the Lord be with thee thou mighty man of valor the Levites tithe to be brought to the temple chamber as it is written bring ye the whole tithe unto the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me here with Seth the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until there be no enough what means until there be no enough said Rami be rabbit means until your lips weary of saying enough enough our Eliezer said the Holy Spirit manifested itself in three places at the tribunal of Shem at the tribunal of Samuel of Ramah and at the tribunal of Solomon at the tribunal of Shem as it is written and Judah acknowledged them and he said she is right it is from me how did he know for certain maybe just as he had come to consort with her some other man had come to consort with her but it was a bath coal that came forth and said she is right constrained by me these things came about at the tribunal of Samuel as it is written here I am witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed whose ox have I taken or whose ass and they said thou hast not defrauded us nor oppressed us neither hast thou taken out of any man's hand and he said unto them the
an inheritance of the congregation of Jacob Torah being in letter value equal to Talmud, Mos Makis 611 I am and thou shalt have no other gods not being reckoned because we heard from the mouth of the mud divine David came and reduced them to eleven principles as it is written a psalm of David Lord who shall sojourn in thy tabernacle who shall dwell in thy holy mountain i.e. that walketh uprightly and two worketh righteousness and three speak truth in his heart that for hath no slander upon his tongue be nor doth evil to his fellow six nor taketh up reproach against his neighbor seven in whose eyes a vile person is despised but eight he honoreth them that fear the Lord nine he sweareth to his own hurt and chandeth not ex he putteth not out his money on interest eleven nor taketh a bribe against the innocent he that doth these things shall never be moved he that walketh uprightly that was Abraham as it is written walk before me and be thou wholehearted and worketh righteousness such as Abihilkiah who speak truth in his heart such as our Saphir hath no slander upon his tongue that was our father Jacob as it is written my father peradventure will feel me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver nor doth evil to his fellow that is he who does not set up in opposition to his fellow craftsmen nor taketh up reproach against his neighbor that is he who befriends his near one's relatives in whose eyes a vile person is despised. That was Hezekiah the king of Judah who dragged his father's bones on a rope truckle bed he hung them that fear the Lord that was Jehoshaphat king of Judah who every time he beheld a scholar disciple rose from his throne and embraced and kissed him calling him father father rabbi rabbi mari mari he sweareth to his own hurt and chandeth not like our Yohanan for our Yohanan once said I shall remain fasting until I reach home he putteth not out money on interest not even interest from me. Even nor taketh a bribe against the innocent such as our Ishmael son of our Hosea it is written in conclusion he that doth these things shall never be moved whenever our Gamaliel came to this passage he used to weep saying only one who practiced all these shall not be moved but anyone falling short in any of these virtues would be moved said his colleagues to him is it written he that doth all these things shall not fall it reads he that doth these things meaning even if only he practices one of these things he shall not be moved for if you say otherwise what of that other similar passage defile not yet yourselves in all these things are we to say that one who seeks contact with all these vices he has become contaminated but if only with one of those vices he is not contaminated surely it can only mean there that if he seeks contact with any one of these vices he has become contaminated and likewise here if he practices even one of these virtues he will not be Moved Isaiah came and reduced them to six principles as it is written I he that walketh righteously and two speak uprightly three he that despiseth the gain of a press iron four that shaketh his hand from holding a bribes he that stopped hath his ear from hearing of blood six and shutteth his eyes from looking upon evil he shall dwell on high he that walketh righteously that was our father Abraham as it is written for I have known him to the end that he may command his children and his household after him etc and speak uprightly that is one who does not put an affront on his fellow in public he that despiseth the gain of a press iron as for instance our Ishmael be Elisha that shaketh his hand from holding a bribes as for instance our Ishmael son of Jose that stopped hath his ear from hearing of blood one who hears not aspersions made against a rabbinic student and remain silent as once did our Eliezer son of our Simeon and shutteth his eyes from looking upon evil as our high Abba. Taught for our high B. Abba said this refers to one who does not peer at women as they stand washing clothes in the courtyard and concerning such a man it is written he shall dwell on high Micah came and reduced them to three principles as it is written it hath been told thee O man what is good and what the Lord doth require of thee I only to do justly and two to love mercy and three to walk humbly before thy God to do justly that is maintaining justice and to love mercy that is rendering every kind office and walking humbly before thy God that is walking in funeral and bridal processions and do not these facts warrant an fortiori conclusion that if in matters that are not generally performed in private the Torah enjoins walking humbly is it not ever so much more requisite in matters that usually call for modesty again came Isaiah and reduced them to two principles as it is said thus saith the Lord I keep ye justice and two do righteousness etc Amos came and Reduce them to one principle as it is said for thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel seek me and live to this Arnam and be Isaac demurred saying might it not be taken as seek me by observing the whole Torah and live but it is Habakkuk who came and based them all on one principle as it is said but the righteous shall lie by his faith said our Hosea be and our master Moses pronounced four adverse sentences on Israel but four prophets came and revoked them Moses said and Israel dwelleth in safety alone at the fountain of Jacob Amos came and revoked that as it is said and said I O Lord God cease I beseech thee how shall Jacob stand alone for he is small and it goes on saying the Lord repented concerning this this also shall not be said the Lord God Moses had said and among those nations thou shalt have no repose Jeremiah came and said thus saith the Lord the people that were left of the sword have found grace in the wilderness even Israel when I go to afford him. Rest Moses had said the Lord is visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and unto the fourth generation Ezekiel came and declared the soul that sinneth it shall die Moses had said and ye shall perish among the nations Isaiah came and said and it shall come to pass in that day that a great horn shall be blown and they shall come that were lost in the land of Assyria etc. Rab observed I have misgivings about that verse and ye shall perish among the nations are Papa demurred at this apprehension of Rab saying could it not perhaps rather be taken in the sense of something lost and searched for as it is written I have gone astray like a lost sheep seek thy servant etc. But it was the latter part of that verse that perturbed Rab and the land of your enemies shall eat you up Mars it demurred saying might it not be understood in the way that cucumbers and pumpkins are eaten long ago as Rab and Gamaliel are Eliezer be. As Rai, our Joshua and our Akiba were walking on the road, they heard the noise of the crowds at Rome on traveling from Pudioli a hundred and twenty miles away. They all fell a weeping, but our Akiba seemed Mary said they to him, Wherefore are you Mary said he to them, Wherefore are you weeping? Said they, These heathens who bow down to images and burn incense to idols live in safety and ease, whereas our temple, the footstool of our god Talmud, Mosmachus B, is burnt down by fire, and should we then not? Weep, he replied, Therefore am I Mary, if they that offend him fear, thus how much better shall fear they that do obey him once again? They were coming up to Jerusalem together, and just as they came to Mount Scopus, they saw a fox emerging from the Holy of Holies, they fell a weeping, and our Akiba seemed Mary, Wherefore said they to him, Are you Mary said he, Wherefore are you weeping? Said they to him, A place of which it was once said, and the common man that draw it nigh shall be put to death is now. Become the haunt of foxes, and should we not weep? Said he to them, Therefore am I merry, for it is written, and I will take to me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jebrekiah. Now, what connection has this Uriah the priest with Zechariah? Uriah lived during the times of the first temple, while the other Zechariah lived and prophesied during the second temple. But Holy Writ linked the later prophecy of Zechariah with the earlier prophecy of Uriah in the earlier prophecy in the days of Uriah. It is written, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, etc. In Zechariah it is written, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women sit in the broad places of Jerusalem. So long as Uriah's threatening prophecy had not had its fulfillment, I had misgivings lest Zechariah's prophecy might not be fulfilled. Now that Uriah's prophecy has been literally fulfilled, it is quite certain that Zechariah's prophecy also is to find its literal fulfillment. Said they to him, Akiba, you have comforted us. Akiba, you have comforted us.